This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 663, recorded on September 11th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Welcome back, Daniel. Thank you. I'm, uh, you know, for those of the people that can see you on the YouTube, you've got quite the thing going. You've got sort of this blue in the back. I see the guitar. It's quite the effect. I'm, I'm, I'm fooling around working on different uh, backgrounds, you know. No, I like it. It's uh, it looks it's sharp. And you got your books. I like the books in the wall. <laughs> I heard you put those bricks in yourself. Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> You're quite the handyman. That's great. <laughs> Daniel, what's been uh, going on these days with COVID-19? All right. Well, for our uh, clinical update, I know we have a lot of uh, busy clinicians that listen, and so they want me to hit the points. And we actually have a lot to cover, um, so I'm going to try to crank through this. Um, you can always put it down to half speed if I talk too fast. <laughs> um, but let me start with my traditional quotation, um, and, and I think people will recognize this. Um, this is a quotation by the, uh, the famous or infamous Donald Rumsfeld. And I pause as people probably say, I know what he's going to say. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The things we don't know, we don't know. And uh, I thought that was appropriate as we're going to be talking about vaccines and uh, the unknown unknowns before us. So this week, I want to share a case and explain why, you know, I I always think, Vince, and I I probably should just tell you this, I think, you know, eventually, you know, I'm going to be done doing these clinical updates because people will have it all. And then a case like this happens. I'm like, you know, I got to kind of keep going. Um, And and it reminds me of the mission statement of Parasites Without Borders. I don't know if people know what that mission statement is. Probably no will be the answer. I wonder if even, you know, Dixon, you, Chuck, or Peter Totes, um, you know, could off the cuff. But our our mission statement is getting knowledge to the to the people and places that need it. That need it. Right? Yeah, I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so you win. You get the gold star. It's a good, and, it's you a know, good and statement. And apparently there are still lots of people and places that need knowledge about COVID-19. So um, when I tell this story, I, I want to be encouraging people, keep listening, um, but, you know, get get some other people to listen to. And I know, you know, clinicians feel like they're perhaps too busy, um, but you're not really too busy to be up to speed on COVID-19. Um, being up to speed, I think, really um, helps with better outcomes. So let, let me tell let me tell this story. Um, this is a woman that I just admitted this Monday, um, or was called a consult on. She was admitted this Monday, and and the story is as follows: um, This woman and her husband um, attended a wake, and the wake was for um, the husband's sister. The husband is in his fifties, or I'm going to say was in his fifties. You'll understand why the tense changes. Um, his sister dies up in um, Boston. Um, she is brought back to the New York area for the wake. And, and the wife is describing to me how, how upset her husband is. You know, he's, he's crying. He's got his um, face in his hands. He's touching the casket. Um, I don't know how many people have been to, um, to awake, but this is actually, you know, people are grieving. Um, after the wake, the husband starts to feel ill, starts to feel crummy, muscle aches, starts to run a fever, has some, some stomach upset, some loose stools. A um, few days later, the wife actually starts to get sick, um, similar symptoms, fever, feeling crummy, you know, your basic viral um, syndrome. Um, she then goes to see um, an urgent care. And I am going to point out it was not a pro-health urgent care. If it was, I would I would be making a, a angry phone call. Um, but she goes there and, and they see her, they examine her, they do a blood test and tell her, oh, you don't have COVID, you'll be just fine. It's probably just a virus. So she leaves, she goes home, and then she relates to me that her husband, he's really doing worse than her. And it's its Sunday. Um, and Sunday, um, you know, she's trying to convince her husband that he really needs to go and get seen because he's, he's not doing well. 
And so she is not doing well herself and basically passes out on the bed. And she wakes up to a, a loud thump. Um, she looks around, she's not sure where her husband is. She's a little disoriented. She sees that the bathroom door is, is closed. So she goes over, tries to open it, is unable to open it more than a little bit um, because as she realizes her husband has, has passed out in the bathroom. She calls EMS and they arrive to find her husband dead in the bathroom. Um, husband is taken away. She stays at home. The next day, it was actually one of her family members goes to visit, finds her down on the ground. She's admitted. This time, not a blood test, but a swab is done. And as I think we can all imagine, it comes back positive for COVID-19. Um, she's now in the hospital. She's hypoxic. She's on oxygen. She's been started on remdesivir. We've started steroids. Um, she was actually progressing. We actually added tocilizumab um, today. Um, so just, just you know, um, you wouldn't think in the New York area that people would miss this diagnosis. You wouldn't think that they would do a serology blood test. Um, so, you know, I feel like we have to keep doing this and, you know, get other people to listen because whoever this person was at that urgent care, um, that's a miss and somebody's, somebody's dead um, and somebody else is quite sick and in the hospital. Um, so, all right. Just want to start off with that. Um, now, news. Um, I was told last week that I'm not very good at the whole good news thing, so I'm just going to call this section news. Um, but the, the first part is, is good news. I mean, this was reiterated on September 9th. The New York Department of Financial Services um, reported that they're extending um, the action requiring all New York health insurers to waive all costs associated with COVID-19. So New York insurers must waive the cost sharing for COVID-19 testing um, in network telehealth visits until November 9th. So no co-pays, no patient um, this is in New York. If there's a concern about COVID-19, if you need COVID-19 testing, you go, you get it done, you don't pay for it. Um, so just, I, I think that that's important. Um, there was an interesting study in open form infectious diseases um, um, that actually described a tenfold higher rate of ICU admissions for people with COVID-19 that had fever that continued past nine days. Um, you know, just sort of the more we can do to sort of know what's ahead of us, um, you know, and this journal is the Open Access Journal of the Infectious Disease Society of America, and it's nice to have more information. Um, now, the bad news. Um, with school reopenings, um, we are seeing more younger individuals with COVID-19. Um, actually did, a, did an interview today about the number of rising cases that we're seeing um, in Suffolk County. Actually, the majority of positives over the last month were in people under the age of 30. Um, 40 percent of the positives here in Nassau County were under the age of 30. Um, you know, when the kids get um, COVID-19, they spread it to the teachers, they spread it to the parents. And we now have had teachers um, die in Missouri, Iowa, Mississippi, South Carolina, many other states. Um, so just a reminder, it's not just the kids, but the communities that are at risk if we don't reopen um, properly. Um, but to say that, um, there was a, an article that just was published in JAMA Internal Medicine, actually just yesterday, um, and it was clinical outcomes <clears throat> in young adults hospitalized with COVID-19. Um, and this article looked at young individuals, right, where a couple things we're realizing were not true. One myth, you know, that young people are immune and, and don't need to worry and can't transmit it. And now it's very clear that that's not true. Um, young people can get COVID-19. Young people can give other people COVID-19. So young individuals can become infected with SARS-CoV-2, and they can share that virus with other individuals. Um, but what happens when they get um, COVID-19. And this article um, looked at over 3,000 individuals aged 18 to 34, non-pregnant, um, and they found that 21%, so a fifth of them required ICU level care, 10% ended up um, on a ventilator, uh, about 3% died, and about 3% by the time um, the hospital stay was over, they were not well enough to go home. They actually had to go to rehabilitation centers. This is 18 to 34-year-olds. These are pretty young folks. Um, another, and we'll get back to this, um, just to include, um, I think everyone is probably aware at this point of the AstraZeneca trial that was stopped. Um, and it, it sounds like this was a um, 
case of transverse myelitis, but I'm going to return to this when we discuss vaccines and um, adverse um, effects and such. Uh, transmission, testing, and schools. Um, you know, I think it's important that we keep um, talking about um, about this. Um, you know, and and one of the scenarios that's been come that's been coming up recently, which I don't think is a problem. I think it's people are starting to think this through a little bit better, and I think that that's fine. Um, and this is what do you do with the the false positives um, when you know you're testing a low prevalence. Um, situation, low prevalence population. So as mentioned, we're, we're running into this. We, we see this on a daily basis in the movie industry and all these large um, organizations that have now um, incorporated uh, testing. Um, you know, and there was a recent article where they were basically saying this, this means we can't use tests that are not 100% um, specific. But, you know, just to run through this, what, what are people talking about? If you're really getting the rapid testing out there, if you test 100 million people a day, and it's 98% specific, so that means 2 million false positives a day, you've got to repeat the test on those 2 million people. So, you know, whatever that, that, number below 100 is your specificity. If you approach this with orthogonal testing, you do a second test, you reduce that by, again, that 90 or 98 percent. So this is something we're, we're already working with, um, you know, as we, as we incorporate this in screening. Um, some people say, oh, just tell those people to stay home for the day. Um, maybe that's fine for a college student to try doing that to uh, some, uh, you know, entertainment executive. And, you know, they would rather you take that eight minutes, do a second test, sort out if it's true or not. So um, th this is in no way, you know, a, a game changer. You know, too many times the world has ended, but this does not end the world and does not, um, you know, disrupt the paradigm. Um, and eventually we're going to get this, not only are we going to get this paper out, but I think I've been talking to people about how the, the research and development group at United Health um, Group is looking at, you know, how often do you need to test? What are the implications of different levels of sensitivity, specificity? Um, and today we actually, um, we're talking more about putting an online calculator. So different uh, groups can go online and say, well, what are my tests available? How many people do I want to test? What's the sensitivity, specificity? And then they can actually look at the impact. If I test every day, if I test every three, seven, 14, if I do no testing and actually sort of figure out how many tests do I need to do at what frequency, at what sensitivity or specificity to prevent what number of infections. So um, I think this is all moving forward and it's all very exciting and um, I look forward to the, the widespread use of the Licka sticks. Let me show you this uh, photograph, uh, which was taken by Amy. This is a rapid test center opening up on Columbus Avenue in New York City. It says 15-minute test. I believe it's a lamp-based test of some sort. You're not familiar yeah. with or involved with this in any way, are you? So not that particular, but what I will tell you, so my, my father's in real estate, and he, he actually is involved with renting um, – we'll call them retail locations. And actually, people are realizing there is a huge demand for testing. And boy, wouldn't it be great to get a test result? Uh, you know, ideal is this situation where you do the lick a stick. Yeah. Um, but as I brought up before, there's interest in uh, sports and theaters and other wanting to open up and wanting to have the ability to have people be tested before they come in the doors. Yeah. And so there's a huge demand for, for, these, um, for these places. And actually, um, shops, you know, have been closed for other reasons. There's empty stores, and now people are saying, "Well, I'll jump in. I'll have a nurse. I'll have a physician. Um, I'll get one of these machines, um, and I'll start providing testing services." So we, we we're going to need lots of tests. Hmm. Um, so, and they're going to charge for them, obviously, right? <laughs> we do live in a capitalist society, Vincent. <laughs> oh, I forgot that part. Right? <laughs> you right. forgot for a second. Right, but ins is insurance going to pay for that, or? Well, that that's been that was the interesting thing about this um, sort of uh, statement that just came out by New York State mm -hmm. again, just reinforcing that you know they they're well aware that a lot of the testing is now being done for screening purpose. So I thought this was really reassuring. They didn't come out and say, "Oh, we're only going to test you know X, Y, and Z criteria." They said COVID testing is still 100% covered. No, no amount of money goes to that patient. So um, this is really positive. At least in New York, it's very clear yeah. that you can you can keep testing. Um, the governor, everyone wants us to test, so continue. 
All right, vaccines. This is the meat of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so um, there's certainly the possibility, I'm going to say, that vaccines, um, well, certainly may, I'm going to keep qualifying myself here, may be available in the U.S. without the normal amount of information about um, safety that we're, that we're used to. Um, and just to give this context, um, you know, a lot of a lot of our clinicians are now being asked to extend their expertise outside of what they normally do. I mean, normally as clinicians, um, most of us deal with um, diagnosis, treatment. Um, I think our pediatrician colleagues are better um, and more knowledgeable about vaccines, but now we all need to be a little bit more knowledgeable. Um, but the typical length of study for these phase three clinical trials has historically been one to four years. Um, I don't think anyone is expecting we're going to wait four years before we um, release vaccines. Um, so what are we concerned might happen? Um, we're concerned about these adverse events. They might be mild. They might be severe. So um, there are some great articles out there starting to look through this, um, but let me do my primer. So for, um, for clinicians, actually for general public, I think this is of interest. There are in general, historically, there have been phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. Um, and I touched on this last time. Phase one are safety trials, a small number of people. Phase two are an expanded um, trial with a slightly um, increased number of people and a broader age range. And they term these trials phase one slash two. They're really just, we're jumping to phase two, right? I'm not sure how you do a one slash two. They're doing phase two trials. They're just skipping the ones. Um, so they've moved up to hundreds of people, a broader range, and they're looking at both safety and immune stimulation. But what we really care about are phase three efficacy trials. Um, I call them efficacy trials. They're called that. These are placebo-controlled trials. They look at efficacy. But even though they're called efficacy trials, they're also looking for the less common side effects. Um, vaccines might have side effects in the range of one per hundred thousand, one per million, things like that. So, um, so let's let's talk about the vaccines, and we're going to go into each one of these in more detail. Um, but I'm going to break them down into four groups. We're going to talk about the whole virus vaccines, inactivated and attenuated. And I'm going to avoid using the word live, even though the CDC throws that every so often, you know, when they start talking about stuff. Um, viral vector vaccines, replicating and non-replicating. Um, nucleic acid vaccines, these are DNA and RNA vaccines. Um, and then our protein-based vaccines, our protein subunit and virus-like particle. Um, so very brief um, mention of immunity. Um, you know, everyone should listen to immune. They'll get a great background. Um, I think Brian Barker has an online immunology course that my wife says she's going to take. So I'll direct people there as well. Um, but in a nutshell, we have our B cells that make antibodies, which are, um, well, I'll just say antibodies are these proteins that hopefully neutralize um, viruses. And we have T cells that are able to detect if a cell has been infected um, with a virus, and then they'll actually destroy those those um, cells. So you can imagine, um, you know, my bias towards the antibodies neutralizing that virus before it gets in. Um, but you know, what I like to say is that you know, there's B cells, there's T cells, but then there's B and T cells working together, and that's ideal. And how do you get B and T cells to work together? Because B cells don't make great antibodies unless they cooperate with T cells, right? This is my bipartisan thing. You know, not only do we all have to get along and work together, but the, immuno the immune system has to as well. And what brings all these people together? Um, you know, who's the great compromiser? Who's, who's, who's going to help us all? It's this wonderful antigen presenting cell. And the most famous is the dendritic cell. I'm going to tell a little story about the dendritic cell. Um, the dendritic cell... Um, was a cell that a lot of people weren't sure existed. It was actually um, uh, it was Ralph Steinman who won the Nobel Prize for this. And talk about a brilliant man. I had lunch with this man. There were like four or five of us having lunch together about three months before he died. And I was working on some B cells. And we had a little bit of a conversation. And off the cuff, something that had taken me two years to discover, he said, well, I think that this subset that you're talking about would probably have these three markers on the surface. And I just sat back and, and said, boy, why am I in this game when there are people as brilliant as this gentleman? <laughs> Because he was completely right. Um, so there, there, there are people that really this, this all makes sense. 
Um, and, you know, I will say as a lowly clinician, um, a lot of those people are working on these vaccines. So I am, I am quite optimistic. But what happens is these antigen presenting cells, um, they, do, they do a couple things. But the big thing they do is within a cell, when we're making proteins, the proteins are always being chopped up into little segments and they're being displayed like flags on the surface of the cell. Um, and this is going to be another story. And this is the head of the Nobel Prize Committee was telling me this story. I was hanging out with a lot of Nobel Prize winners one year. Um, this was in the past. Um, and he was talking about a story in Sweden where they were worried that um, the Russians were sending subs into their water. So they, they spent a lot of money and they made this book that had pictures of all the potential foreign um, submarines that might be coming into their waters. And, you know, and everyone was supposed to carry this, this 200 page beautiful book around with them. So whenever they were out sailing around the water, they, they could quickly look through it if they recognized one of these. And then finally someone realized like, well, instead of showing us all these hundreds of different submarines, why don't you just show us the pictures of what Swedish submarines look like? And then, and so what happens is the, the T cells have basically, they're fine as long as they see that you're you. Um, but then if they see something that's not you, that's what, that's what gets them to, to trigger, to freak out. Um, and so in this whole process, um, these antigen presenting cells are going to help educate T cells, the T cells are going to help educate B cells. And at the end of the day, we're going to have B cells making antibodies that hopefully will neutralize the virus. We're going to have T cells that are helping the B cells do a good job of that, the T helper cells, making all the right cytokines, et cetera. And we're going to have T cells that are going around, hopefully destroying any virally infected cells. But now, now how does all this magic happen? How do we make it happen? So that's vaccines. Um, and I know on the last comments, there was some comments, oh my gosh, have the TWIV people become anti-vaxxers? And I'm going to say no. Um, <laughs> I love vaccines, but I like vaccines that work, uh, vaccines we can trust. So let's talk about the whole virus vaccines. I mean, the, the simplest here is to grow up a whole bunch of virus um, and then you know use something like formaldehyde and basically... Uh, prevent the virus from from having the ability to be active. And uh, here you're just basically giving the raw material. Um, the other approach is you take a virus that has somehow been made wimpy, attenuated. This can either be genetically engineered or passage through. The virus goes in and this is enough to, to go around. It can replicate. You don't have to put quite as much in. Um, but you do have to be a little careful because if someone is immune suppressed, what might seem like a wimpy virus to Vincent and myself might not be so wimpy to someone without an immune system. So the advantages of the attenuated is you don't need to make quite as much because it can make more once it's injected. The, uh, the advantage and disadvantage of the inactivated is you need to make a whole bunch more, um, but you don't have to worry about the replication going on. Um, but now things get a little bit fancier. Instead of this, you can actually make up your own viral construct, your own viral uh, vaccines. And here, what you can do, um, and this is something I enjoy doing for many years, I'm going to say I enjoyed it uh, there at Columbia, just down the hall from Vincent, um, is you actually, you, you mix and match. And you might take a certain um, viral construct and then introduce a protein or the spike gene, for instance, from another uh, virus. So in this sense, you're taking maybe an adenovirus construct and then sticking um, the genetic code for the spike so that now you have what looks sort of like an adenovirus, except it's studded with the proteins from you know, the payload from what you're after. And you can set these up in a way where they really just get into one cell and then produce all the proteins and that's where it goes. Or you can actually set these up where they can replicate. And again, you can, you can look at and think about the differences there. Um, and it really relates back to, you know, how much do you have to put in? Now it gets, I'll say, to the IKEA vaccines, but these are these are worse than IKEA. These are the nucleic acid vaccines. This is where you go to IKEA. They don't even give you the parts to the chair. They just give you the blueprints, and you've got to go like cut the wood yourself. So um, <clears throat> they can give you the DNA vaccines, and here you're basically going to get DNA, which is this got to get into the nucleus, right? And this is, I think, tough for those of us that are far from our cellular biology. But, you know, you take DNA, the DNA has to get into the nucleus. And in the nucleus, the DNA is turned into RNA. The RNA is going to come out and then it's going to be made into the proteins. 
Um, sort of a, a shorter thing here and something that a lot of uh, folks are working on now um, is you just go right to the RNA. The RNA doesn't have to get into the nucleus, uh, which is good and bad. Um, one of the good things by not getting into the nucleus is that being in the cytoplasm, it can be directly turned into those proteins and now can start making those proteins. Proteins that are expressed um, in hopefully a form that the B cells will recognize and react to, but also all the little amino acids are being chopped up, displayed on the surface. So those antigen presenting cells, those dendritic cells can educate the T cells and we can get both a T cell response and an education of our B cells so we get a better B cell response, okay? And then the last one, we're almost here, this is not that hard, is our protein-based vaccines. And this is, you really just cut to the end. You say, you know what? I want antibodies, I want T cells against the spike protein, so I'm just gonna give either the person a whole bunch of spike protein, that's the protein subunit approach, um, or you could actually make these viral-like particles where it's really just a sort of an envelope of a virus studded with the protein subunits. Um, and again, it's gonna go through the same process, you're gonna get your dendritic cells involved, and they're gonna help our B cells, they're gonna help our T cells, and they're gonna get everyone to work together. Can I put you on the spot, Daniel? Please do. <laughs> give us give us examples of licensed vaccines with all these, starting from inactivated vaccines. Oh my gosh, you are you are putting me on the spot. So what do I work on, Daniel? You work on you work on polio. So this this will be a good one. <laughs> so polio, right? Um, we've got oral polio, right? That's attenuated, so that's perfect. Right. Um, and then we got that we got that injectable that's right. stuff. Right. Very good. Okay. Two licensed vaccines. How about a vectored vaccine? Do you know of a licensed vectored vaccine? Licensed vectored vaccine. Now, I guess the Ebola one is actually a licensed vector. It vaccine. is. Absolutely yeah. right. That's right. Also, uh, the dengue vaccine, Dengvaxia, is also vectored. It's vectored yeah. in a yellow fever virus vaccine backbone. How about a nucleic acid? Are there any licensed? Nucleic now, the acid. mRNA, there's none for people. Um, there are, I believe, some in the veterinary world. That's right. There's a West Nile horse for horses. That's a DNA vaccine. Yeah. So. All right. Vi how about a virus-like particle? <laughs> um, now you are putting me on the spot. I, I think I've reached the limit of my knowledge, Vincent. Human papillomavirus vaccine. <laughs> an oh, that's excellent. And okay, the hepatitis yes. B virus vaccine. Yes. And purified protein subunits. This is a vaccine you'll get over 50 years of age. Oh, so is this the uh, the shingles vaccine? Yeah, the new one, the Shingrix. Glycoprotein, yeah. adjuvanted glycoprotein, right? Yeah. Okay, you good know, one job. Day when I reach, one day when I reach <laughs> 50, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, that's in the rear view mirror. I have to say, Daniel, my, my uh, health um, insurance is United Healthcare. Okay. And, and and I can get Shingrix flu vaccine free at my local pharmacy because of that. They oh, I take, think that's fantastic. They take care of it, yeah. It's a good company. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> now, all these uh, uh, approaches are being used for SARS-CoV-2, right? They they are actually, and I, I went through like a little bit of the the different ones because you can you know you could say well what if I want to you know go down the whole virus vaccine um, pathway, um, you know and there's a bunch of people working on that viral vectors you've got a bunch of people working on that um, the RNA vaccines we're hearing a lot about those mm. as well um, so there's really everyone is using you know everyone is using all these different platforms there are what over 200 vaccines in yeah. development yeah um, and so. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, first I'm going to say, how do I volunteer for a vaccine trial and talk to people a little bit about that. Um, but then I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, something that will relate to volunteering for a vaccine trial, but also what do you do if a vaccine, you know, might be released without that one to four years of safety data that we're used to. Um, so just to go through, you actually can sign up and I'm, and I'm going to actually encourage people to sign up who are listening. Now, I don't know the full demographics of our listeners, but one of the things about vaccine um, studies is you need large numbers. You, know, you need 30,000 people or more, and 30,000 is what a lot of these trials are shooting for. Um, but they can't be 30,000 know, white guys in their 20s. This needs to be... <laughs> 
I'm looking at Vincent. He's not a white guy in his twenties, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but you know, you need people of different ages. You need people of different genetic backgrounds, and so you know, if if you're a white guy in their twenties, um, you know, you need you need women. Uh, you need people of color. You need all the different um, groups, and so you know, if you wanna if you wanna sign up or go through the eligibility screening for the Moderna vaccine, you go to, you know, a website, you go to www.modernatx.com. If you want to sign up for one of the Pfizer studies, you go to covidvaccinestudy.com. I mean, these are, these are catchy. If you want to sign up for the AstraZeneca, when they start enrolling folks again, um, you go to c19vaccinestudy.com. Um, or if you just want to sign up to be alerted to any vaccine trials, um, you go to coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org. So they're basically, you know, I sort of encourage our listeners, if you're interested in being part of this effort, if you're interested in um, being part of this, uh, go hop on your computer uh, because, you know what, the trials need that whole diversity uh, to fill because there's a several step process here. Um, you need to screen the people. You need to enroll them in the trial. They need to get vaccinated. And sometimes I hear, oh, this site is going to vaccinate 50 people a day. And I do the math. I'm like, that's 50 times 30, 1500. We're going for 30,000. Um, you need lots of sites, lots of people getting vaccinated um, to get to that first step. Some of the vaccines require a booster, right? So a month to enroll and then a month when you're vaccinating everyone. And then a month later when you're doing a booster if needed, and then you need exposures. And most of these studies are powered with a 30,000 um, for 200 infections or more. Once you get to 200, we should be starting to get into a realm of potentially some statistical significance. So for to get 200, you're saying 30,000 is a good enrollment number? You know, there's two reasons why we want the 30,000, because there's two sides to the vaccine study. One is you want efficacy data, and you need about 200 infections before you can really start getting um, the power to determine that. But you need 30,000 because you want to start picking up um, these less common events. Uh, you know, we're willing to, well, historically, I'm going to get into this, we've been willing to tolerate a certain um, incidence of side effects. But if you don't have 30,000 people in your trial, you're not going to start seeing these um, these these issues. So, so this is going to, you, you roll me right into my next topic, uh, which is how do you make a, a decision with limited data and how do you decide whether or not to be enrolled in one of these trials? So. Um, I wanted to put this in, in context. Um, you know, different vaccines have different safety profiles, and we're willing to accept different risks based upon the context. So um, I wanted to use smallpox vaccination as an example, right? Um, and so this vaccine involves getting injected with an active vaccinia virus. Um, and so let's suppose, as we ran into a number of years back, you're about to send your troops into some area of conflict. Perhaps it's in the Middle East. Um, we have some information that maybe later turns out not to be true, that your troops might be exposed to smallpox based upon a bioweapons attack. Um, and when, when you look through, um, you know, they say, oh, a certain percent of people have, quote unquote, mild vaccine related symptoms. Uh, which was 30% of people got so sick that they missed days of work, three days of work on average. So that, that's kind of a little more in my mind than mild. If you say, if you get this vaccine, um, anticipate missing um, a few days of work, like a one in three chance of that. Um, but then we saw, we saw, you know, we saw deaths, a certain number of deaths. It was, um, we saw a um, certain number of people had brain inflammation. Um, so when you start doing the math and you say like, oh, we give this to 300 million um, people, 300 million Americans, and you start saying, oh, well, there are rare events, but those rare events start to add up. So if you give smallpox vaccine to 300 million Americans, you end up with 72,000 cases of disseminated vaccinia. You end up with 300 deaths. You end up with 360 cases of encephalitis or brain inflammation. Um, so there are different things to be thinking about when you look at vaccines. I mean, that's a vaccine that's available. We now use a diluted um, vaccine, um, but you've got to start asking, you know, what, what are what are the risks I'm willing to take 
if I'm going to be in a different situation, if I'm an ER worker in a part of the country that doesn't have good personal protective equipment stockpiles, and I feel like my chances are quite high, um, you know, what risks might I take? So um, what are these risks? The minor adverse effects in general are what we say pain, fever, or muscle aches, headache. Um, but then we're all starting to learn about the serious adverse effects, death, that's um, maybe as bad as it gets. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, this is this rapid onset of ascending paralysis over hours to weeks, um, with about 15% of people affected requiring mechanical ventilation. Um, in general, this is thought to be caused by autoreactive antibodies triggered either by natural infection or vaccination. Um, and although most people fully recover over weeks to years, um, about a third never fully recover, um, and about 7 to 8% die. Um, so that's something to worry about. Transverse myelitis, something which um, may be the effect that we um, saw um, reported in this um, in this vaccine study, the AstraZeneca. And it's not clear, right, that this is related to the vaccine or just something. We see this about one in 100,000 individuals. So you enroll enough people, you got a one in three chance that someone in your trial is just going to have this. Um, but here's where you're having inflammation of the myelin in the spinal cord. And um, this can be either caused by a virus itself, adenovirus itself can actually cause this. It can be caused by antibodies. It also can be caused by um, T cells that are targeting. So um, encephalitis, brain inflammation. Um, and then kind of the last thing that we're not going to necessarily know about for a year is the antibody dependent enhancement. And this is where initially you have a great level of antibodies. It's protective, but once those antibodies drop below a certain level, if you get exposed, this is what we see in dengue, if you get exposed, you're much worse off than having never been vaccinated. So the reason you need that 30,000 and the reason ideally you have a year is you're not going to get that last one until you're at about a year and you see what happens when those antibody levels fall below a certain level and these people get exposed. Are they going to get sicker? Um, you know, maybe there's a requirement that we've really got to revaccinate those people to avoid that last. Uh, so. And since there are some rumors that there might be some vaccines out a little bit sooner than we're used to, um, people may actually be starting to make these decisions in this kind of a context. Daniel, what's the death uh, rate with the smallpox vaccine? I think you mentioned it. One in like 241 million, right? So it's very- yeah, So it's that's very not low. something you will pick up in a 30,000 person trial. Yeah. And, so I think it's, it's about one in a million. So it's one in a million death with smallpox, if I remember correctly, or-, or Emailers can write in and tell me if that's true. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's one in a million. Now, so the, if you do a 30,000 trial, yeah, you you're, not gonna, you're not going to see that. I mean, right? even uh, even if death is one in 100,000 or any serious complication, like Guillain-Barre, I think, is one in 100,000 for flu vaccine. You yeah, don't pick actually, it up. Yeah, actually, that's... Yeah, that's the classic for Guillain-Barre is one in a hundred. So you're most likely not going to see it. And, you know, I think that brings up, right, the, uh, the swine flu, right, mm -hmm. um, you know, which... Ford really was worried. You know, he thought we were about to be in a pandemic, you know, and there were 45 million um, people were vaccinated and there were about 450 people that Correct. ended up um, developing Guillain-Barre. Um, and, and just just to be honest, right, you, you have to look at those numbers, um, 45 million, 450. I mean, it sounded when you, you read the articles like thousands of Americans were paralyzed. Um, you know, 450 is, tr is a tragedy. We're, we're losing a thousand people a day. Um, to COVID-19. So the math uh, the math might be a little different in the middle of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, you have to balance the uh, lethality of COVID-19 with whatever the vaccine's going to do, right? Yeah. I mean, I th and I think that this, we're, we're in a slightly different um, world than we historically have been with vaccines. So there will be certain people in high risk situations who say, I would rather I would rather take that risk of a vaccine than that risk mm -hmm. of not getting a vaccine. So, um, you know, I I don't think we're anti-vaxxers. <laughs> I think we're just uh, I, my my whole goal is to educate people and let them make their own decisions. Um, you know, bad decisions what keeps me in business. Well, we also on Twiv talk about the risks and benefits a lot, and people can get informed in a deep yeah. way, not in two minutes from your local news. Listen to Twiv and Daniel and all of us. Daniel, yeah, I mean, if, I think uh, that there's a lot of important information people will benefit from having. So, Daniel, if you had a choice, which vaccine would you want to 
inactivated, attenuated, vectored, <laughs> subunit, or virus-like particle, since they'll all be available? Yeah, you know, I know everyone like skirts this, um, but I'm going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I'm not just thinking about the moment, but I'm thinking about like the future. Mm -hmm. And I really like the idea of the mRNA vaccines because I feel like this is a vaccine that going forward, if we get that platform um, yeah. working, um, it's really going to be something you can, you know, as as we saw, it may be something you can very quickly you know, get out there and start, start testing. So, um, you know, I know that makes people immediately think of Moderna, right? They've got the mRNA. It's like built into their name. Um, Pfizer also has an mRNA vaccine out there. Um, Pfizer has a much longer track record, right? Of, mm -hmm. of getting vaccines out there. I, I don't think Moderna has ever produced a vaccine or licensed <laughs> one before, but <No. laughs> that's okay. Um, but yeah, I, I have to say, you know, not just thinking about this pandemic, but just thinking about, let's say the yeah. future of mankind. Um, it would be great to really have um, a good um, vaccine platform that we were ready to deploy. And, and I, I like the mRNA approach. I worry a little bit, I'll tell you in all honesty, about using adenovirus as a, as a vector. Mm -hmm. um, as a platform, um, because adenoviruses, you know, they're they're not without risks. I mean, so. Well, Alan Dove recently said he wants the vaccine that Tony Fauci gets. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, so a last section, and then we're going to end it. Um, so just, I always like to talk about understanding the course of COVID-19. Um, you know, and the patients uh, still suffering for months after the acute phase of COVID, uh, they could at least take some solace that this pervasive myth that this was just a short-term illness is, is constantly being dispelled. Um, and there certainly are mental health impacts as well as physical. Um, there's a growing number of individuals, um, you know, who have issues months out. Um, recently, I, I've actually seen a lot of individuals start to develop um, what are really uh, classic for migraine or vascular type headaches, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. One of the theories behind migraines is that there's this um, inflammatory trigger. Um, and these migraines that I'm seeing in these quote unquote long haulers, people with tail of COVID, seem to be responding to typical migraine therapies. So the triptans, other, mm -hmm. other therapies. So. I will end there. And again, I'm going to thank everyone. And a lot of people have really been tremendous going to parasiteswithoutborders.com and helping us support floating doctors, um, helping us um, give them the funds so that they can basically keep these people from starving, uh, give them whatever access to medical care that we can provide. And these are the indigenous people in this remote part of Panama that I've worked with over the years. Uh, many of them I know personally. So thank you for um, for going to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. For every dollar you donate, we are, we're doubling that. Uh, so hey, thank you. Great. All right. I'll just give you two quick questions. Okay. Uh, first one are these going to be as hard as the vaccine ones? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, first one is from Nathan, who is an urgent care PA from San Antonio, Texas, who, by the way, uh, loves TWIP. He said, parasitology is my favorite ID infection. He wants to know if uh, your thoughts on using indomethacin in place of other NSAIDs. Uh, indomethacin. Indomethacin. And he sh gives some evidence that it actually has some antiviral properties. So he says, you know, this could be a, a two-handed therapeutic. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I, I now that we're in September, um, I, I hopefully we're not, um, you know, as ready to decide that indomethacin is an effective antiviral for SARS as some people may have been back in March and April. Um, I think it's fine, as we now know, to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So whether it be ibuprofen, whether it be um, naproxen, whether it be indomethacin, whether it be aspirin, I think these actually can really be helpful um, for some of the symptoms. Um, I'm I'm not sure that indomethacin uh, really is going to have uh, great uh, potency, you know. And um, yeah, there, there's tons of you know in vivo stuff out there for so many different things. Um, um, and it'd be great at some point to to know if if there were certain um, you know sort of drugs on the shelf, so to speak, uh, that could be helpful. But yeah, I um, I think it's absolutely fine um, if you want to use this as your um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory of choice. Um, but I think the others seem to be um, effective as well. 
there actually is a clinical trial on uh, recruiting in Arizona for, you're going to love this, Daniel, hydroxychloroquine, indomethacin, and Zithromax <laughs> for COVID-19. <Okay. laughs> all right. So we'll know, we'll, we'll know because it's, they're all given together. All right. One more uh, it from- would, It would be better to not give them all together. That would be my two cents. Yeah. There's also one um, for ivermectin with- Zinc and vitamin D and vitamin C all together. I just don't know how you can figure anything out. All right, one more from Penny. All right, she has a dilemma, which I thought you could help with. Uh, her husband's mother passed away in June. The service is next week. Uh, the father's going to be there. Uh, he's 92, and she wants to know, is this, a, is this a big risk for my husband to go visit his father, whose wife just died? Uh, and then drive back and live with me. Will I be at risk? What should I do? Can I be safely? Can can it be done safely with distancing and masking? Yeah. So um, this is Philly. This is Penny from Philadelphia. Okay. So um, I was looking to see where you were because you know we do think that being outdoors is a much better way to approach things. Memorial services wakes. I always worry about because mm -hmm. let's be honest, you're, you're grieving. You're upset. It's not a great time to say, I'm not going to reach out and hold you. I mean, there, yeah, there's yeah. physical contact when we comfort someone. Um, so this this can be tough. When you, you physically get there, you know, are you really going to sit six feet away from your 92-year-old father who's crying? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and just be like, hey, I'm my six feet away with my mask on. So um, I'm most concerned that you get in these situations and, you know, you, you may say, oh, we're going to wear masks, we're going to social distance, but come on, this is, you know, this is someone you love, someone you care about, they're hurting. Um, it's really hard to not just go over and give them a hug. So, you know, how do you do this safely? You get tested. Um, you, you let, you know, you let whoever it is that you work with your doctor, that this is a priority and it is a priority. I mean, a 92 year old father um, may not live past, you know, past this pandemic. They may not survive until there's vaccines and effective medications. So um, I was doing an article for, I think it was Reader's Digest or Consumer Reports. Sorry to lump you two together. Um, <laughs> but it was about how incredibly hard and socially isolating the pandemic has been on our seniors um, and particularly situations yeah. like this. I mean, if you're an older individual, other older individuals are dying. You're losing your friends. You're socially distanced from uh, your grandchildren, your children. Um, and so a great way to make this safe is to figure out a way to get tested and then go see your 92-year-old father and actually give him a hug. Yeah. I, probably everyone at the wake should be tested as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ideally. All right. Okay. That's our weekly COVID-19 Clinical Report with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thanks so much, Daniel. All right. Thank you. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Pommier. Hello, Vincent. It's nice out. It's a little cloudy, but it's nice. It's not raining like it did yesterday. And the temperature is very uh, tolerable. It's in the high 60s, low 70s. It's peaceful. Looks peaceful. Unfortunately, today it's not it's not the same day. day that it was on 9/11 uh, when uh, yeah I sat in my office at work and watched a perfect day turn into a tragedy. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody! Big smile. <laughs> There's where your screenshot, Vincent. <laughs> you see the last one? Did you see? <laughs> yeah, I saw the last one. You got it. Yeah, I so, got it. I actually had to uh, get I had to get Ralph not quite the way I wanted it just so I could get you smiling. I got him adjusting yeah, he's his thing. Reaching for his, yeah. yeah. So very good, very good. um I didn't smile long enough. I'll try to smile more this time. <laughs> uh, at any rate, this is important. Okay. This may not mean a whole hell of a lot to you guys, but it's 70 degrees in Austin right That's now. That's awesome. That's down from like a hundred. Okay. We had a cold front go through. It's like dropping out a warp. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. Uh, yeah. our high today is going to be 81. If I look at the 10-day forecast, I see only one day in the low 90s and the rest in the 80s. Uh, we're probably going to see wow. 90 degrees again a few times before we're into winter, but I think the hundreds are behind us, so this is all good. Yep. So for, from September, mid-September through the end of the year, you usually don't have hundreds, right? No. No, yep. it's, uh, hundreds are July, August stuff. Got it. From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. 
Good to be here. It's uh, 68 Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius, and lovely blue skies, uh, gorgeous skies. day. Um, actually reminds me of the weather on a 9-11 on a 19 years ago. Mm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's completely clouded over here, Dixon. Oh, right? okay. Yeah, very different. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Uh, it's pretty similar to what Dixon described, 74 uh, degrees here, so very similar. And I do have to say, um, sometimes when um, people are talking about microaggressions, um, one of the uh, most famous ones is women being told to smile that they don't smile enough. Um, so I'm really happy that I am not the one who's being told to smile. <laughs> yeah, I never told you yeah. to smile because you're. I could pick any frame in the video and you're always smiling. Yeah, that's true. This is true. This Good. Is yes. true. This and, is true. and since, and if you weren't, <coughs> I would not ask you to because of microaggression. I have been <laughs> warned. Although Rich Condit, uh, actually it wasn't me. It was someone else who said you didn't smile. One of your kids or something, right? Uh, well, my mother. You know, <laughs> you never smile, Richard. Okay, that you can't complain about microaggressions from mom. Yeah, no, that, that doesn't it. count. <laughs> but so, kind of mom. so, you know, when I capture the thumbnail for the video, I try and find one where everybody's smiling. It's very hard. Yeah. Most of the time, I don't get rich when all the others are smiling. But I remember once you got actually like my. This, though. My uh, my yeah. my students always thought I was angry. They thought I didn't smile really? enough. They were scared of my voice. They were scared of the oh, you know large large frame and that kind of stuff. So I I got so I would start off you know in a new series of lectures. I would start off by telling them, "Look, uh, I know I look scary, but underneath this coarse <laughs> exterior beats a heart of pure brillo." <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Listen so that, up, worms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me tell you a quote. You did, uh, you did the opening sequence from Full Metal Jacket, right? <laughs> exactly. That, that reminds right. me of a quote that I want to tell you before I forget. So I was in a Zoom meeting yesterday being run by Steve Morse, who Dixon knows. Oh, yeah. sure. He's been on Twiv a couple of times. And he asked someone a question and there was no answer. And then a minute later, that person came back. I'm so sorry. I was on a phone call. <laughs> and Steve said, that reminds me once. Someone said at a meeting, um, I know we have your divided attention. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? We have your divided attention. <clears throat> People are always doing all kinds of stuff, right? That's the problem with a Zoom Indeed. meeting. And that's what that's what Rich does a lot because he'll say, I didn't know you guys talked about that already because he's off Googling something, you know, and drinking. I'm just his, trying to keep up. So you know? Know? I'm not picking when on you. I, when I divide my attention right. on Twiv, it's to look up something relevant to Twiv. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. It's no problem. All right. Uh, if you like Unless what I'm we, removing a cat from the desk, but that doesn't happen very often. That's I've got fine. the door closed today. If you like what we do here on Twiv, uh, you could support us financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. We'd appreciate your support. If you'd like to chat with a virologist, if Four hours of TWIV isn't enough every week. <laughs> you want more? Go to ASV.org and scroll down till you see Chat with a Virologist. They have a collection of curated virologists. By uh, so, Kathy you know, said, I just, okay, they're okay. So do they curate them in a brine or is it more of a fermentation brine? <laughs> Half sour. <laughs> sour. Sour microbiologists, yes. So I tried to do this. Uh, today I w I'm right now I'm looking at asv.org mm -hmm. and I'm scrolling down and I don't see where somebody can chat with me. So huh. it, it should be a link um, that you email and you get a list of names um, of it's people gone. who you might want to chat with. It's gone. He's really, right. it's gone. Huh? Well, hmm. I am. Scheduled yeah, to chat their... with quite a few people. Oh, there it is. It they've just showed their... up. So they're rotating panels. So you have to just wait uh, oh. until it shows up. It will show up. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Okie dokie. Oh, nobody wants to chat with me. I'm really hurt. Well, they hear you all the time here on Twiv. Oh, there it is. Chat with a virologist. Yeah. Why? Is... Have now... you put your name on the list? I'm going to have to check. <laughs> uh, I was, I, uh, I thought that I was on the list based on some correspondence, but maybe I'll need to check. Can, if, uh, um, so, uh, can I find, I guess I just have to email whoever this is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, we have quite a bit of uh, stuff for you today. Stuff is the word. <laughs> stuff. What would be a better word than stuff? Inf- um, information like s- sounds kind of <laughs> content. 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 We have a lot of content. content. That's the internet word, content. We have yes. content for you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Starting Uncle with Sam. a letter. Curated that, content. That I received uh, from Ann Scalka, who received it from Lucy Shapiro, who's a professor at Stanford. And this is September 9th. Dear colleagues, as infectious disease physicians and researchers, microbiologists and immunologists, epidemiologists and health policy leaders, we stand united in efforts to develop and promote science-based solutions that advance human health and prevent suffering from coronavirus pandemic. In this pursuit, we share commitment to a basic principle derived from the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Primum non nocere or nocere. I'm not sure which one. To prevent harm to the public's health, we also have both a moral and an ethical responsibility to call attention to the falsehoods and misrepresentations of science recently fostered by Dr. Scott Atlas, a former Stanford Medical School colleague and current senior fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. Many of his opinions and statements run counter to established science and by doing so undermine public health authorities and the credible science that guides effective public health policy. The preponderance of data accrued from around the world currently supports each of the following statements. And then they go through all the things he's countered. The use of face masks work, which he says they don't work. Transmission occurs from asymptomatic people, which he doesn't agree with. Children of all ages can be infected with SARS-CoV-2. The pandemic will be controlled when we have herd immunity. Um, Encouraging herd immunity through unchecked community transmission is not a safe public health strategy. And then they they go on. And then undersigned are many uh, professors from Stanford in various departments. And I think this is a great letter. I wish this were done for, say, the guy here at Columbia. um, Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz. (laughs) How come we all knew that name? (laughs) I would be happy to sign it. I think people have to be called out for saying things that run counter to common sense science. Especially when they're peddling this crap on the reputation of a prestigious university. Yes. You know, their their colleagues at that university then have that reflected upon them. That's exactly So he was recently brought on to the administration in what role? What's his title? Does anyone He's he's another one of the schmucks (laughs) through this revolving door who they keep shopping for somebody who'll endorse whatever whatever wacky nonsense has dribbled out of the Trump's mouth lately and and they (laughs) got a hold of him. I guess he he decided they they had the right price or something or this was a good shot at, at getting right some price. airtime. He's an and, advisor. Uh, okay, he's an advisor. Yeah, he, yeah, he's a, he's he's the COVID he's the COVID pandemic advisor, the latest he's, one. Is he an influencer? <laughs> <laughs> I love that term. Influencer. Yeah, he's an influencer for some people. I'm sure. I exactly. just look. He is saying things that are scientifically dumb. All right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And right. I just disagree. I don't care what party he's with. It's dumb, and for people to listen to him and for the president to push him forward is simply unacceptable. And I don't care if you think I'm being partisan or political. I don't care what you think. This is just downright wrong, okay? And these professors had the guts to call it out, and I'm very glad, although, as we know, nothing will happen. No, you're standing for science and actually talking about correct science. Right. Yeah, but, you know, the people who complain... They just don't like what they think my politics are or our politics, right? That's too bad. I'm sorry. We're talking about science. They would just call them alternate facts. <laughs> the problem is that there. I mean, the the Republican Party has placed itself as an enemy of fact because there are a lot of facts that have come through scientifically in the past 20 years that don't align with their policies. And so instead of realigning their policies, they have systematically decided, and this has been a gradual process that's Mm -hmm. gone on for a number of years, but it has culminated in the Trump administration. um, And they've decided that they're just not going to be bound by facts. They're going to be bound by ideology. And so that's where we are. And now you've got somebody, you know, plucked out from Stanford to try and lend credibility to this nonsense. It's for us, for scientists who have had our careers defined by facts, Right, not what you believe for ideology. This is 
abhorrent to us. And that's why we I, I would us. love to see a fact based Republican Party. I mean, it's not philosophically, it's not a fundamentally wrong concept that the party was built on or anything. This is a recent thing in the past a yeah, couple of decades well, that they kind of drifted into this nonsense. Mm -hmm. Remember, yeah, Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower, never... who I thought was a fine president, was actually a Republican. Yeah. 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 Of course. So was Lincoln. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, but you only have to go back to Eisenhower to find somebody who was really on the ball and, you know, warning about a lot of things that have become now yeah. promoted by like, like the military the, industrial complex. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. The One of the greatest that... speeches in American political history, and it was completely ignored. Sure. Whenever... Whenever um, science stands in the way of profit making, profit making wins. Unfortunately, in this, in that the, has in been this administration, yes. it wins. So they ignore the facts and just go ahead. Which is unfortunate because if you think about so many things that have made progress and made profits, um, right. they have science and technological backgrounds. Yes. Um, so it the seems as though the American economy <laughs> since World War II has been based on science. Well, I would yes, say that exactly right. the only reason, as we will hear from Alan in a moment, that we can even think about making a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine in a year is because of the recent progress in science yeah, that we have course. done, right? That many, many scientists have pushed forward for the last 20, 30 years. All that technology is coming to fruition. And that's right. so that's, that's what we here on TWIV uh, go by. Yeah. Indeed. So, um, speaking of Alan, I think he's here with us today. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm over here. <laughs> Apparently, Alan was uh, at a webinar recently. He's going to tell us all about it. Yeah. And by so the way, was, before you um, start. Um, uh, it was sponsored by a group that I've had um, some involvement with over the years, the National Adult and Influenza Immunization Summit, which is a mouthful. But they, they have this meeting every May where they, they talk about flu vaccination and then they they morphed that as several years ago into talking about adult immunization and, and also flu vaccination um so neat organization we'll have a link in the show notes um anyway they have been sponsoring some calls on the pandemic because it's obviously very relevant to what they do and the one that they had this week which was on wednesday um was with uh top level executives from eight out of the nine companies that are furthest ahead with SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 vaccines in U.S. trials. Um, and uh, so these were chief scientific officer, chief medical officer type folks, although uh, I think it was Moderna. Yeah, Moderna had their CEO on. Um, so these are these are the folks who are running the trials, who were on to talk about where things stand. And um uh, the companies were um, Pfizer, Moderna, Novavax, Inovio, Medicago, Sanofi Pasteur, J&J uh, &J Janssen, and Merck. AstraZeneca was conspicuously absent, um, so they're the ninth of these companies, and nothing was said about that, but I presume that's because they didn't really feel like having to deflect a whole bunch of questions that they can't answer yet uh, about their suspended trial, and you've, that's already been discussed here. Um, so first of all, just my overall impression on the call, I've obviously followed this story quite a lot, but seeing all these folks put together on one screen and presenting all that's going on simultaneously was kind of mind blowing. Um, I mean, I was aware that there was a lot of collaboration between companies and that people were, were really taking that kind of collaborative approach. Um, but just the the collegial interaction between these top level folks of basically we're all in this together, even though they're obviously competitors, was very cool to see. And the speed of this, um, yeah, I've been covering biotech and pharma companies for twenty plus years, and I, and just the idea that you can start a phase two three trial when you just published your phase one last week, right? Like, <laughs> wow. Um, so all of these companies except Merck, um, are either in phase two, three trials now, or they expect to be by the end of the year. Merck expects to get to phase two, three in early 2021. So these are all pretty much running neck and neck. Um, they are all following pretty much the same set of standards because um, Operation Warp Speed, BARDA, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are all on the same page with how these should be set up. Uh, so all the trials are looking at subjects age 18 and over, 
the um, primary endpoint they're using is prevention or mitigation of disease, not infection. Now, of course, they're going to be testing people for infection, but the primary endpoint and the basis for whatever approvals come out of this will be um, preventing or mitigating disease. And the bar has been set for a minimum of 80% efficacy based on that disease prevention thing. Uh, so, Alan, yeah, yeah, interrupt hand just up. a minute. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, if, if you're going to test for infection, how do you do that? That um, it's it's in the trial protocols, but they're going to be presumably doing PCR tests on these people. Um, I don't know in each trial at what interval. Okay. Um, they are screening people going into the trials for um, uh, current infection and for antibodies. It seems to me you would want to screen ultimately for antibodies against spike and something else like N that's not in the vaccine. Yes. So and you can discriminate between natural infection and vaccination. Yes. And there were, that was not, I mean, this was a series of rapid fire presentations, so they didn't go into all the details, but at least two companies, I think, mentioned that they were doing exactly that. Either they were testing for a component that's unique to an active infection or, you know, doing something else to distinguish where the immunity was coming from. So where does this uh, 80% come from? Because remember, the FDA has said they will approve anything over 50%. This is the target that people on the call agreed that they were aiming for. So if it's less than 80, what, what's the... If it's less than 80, then maybe FDA will be happy, but um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation won't be. And I should, I'll go ahead and mention at this point that all of these companies are very actively planning on the on these being global vaccines. Um, so um, so they're they're looking at eighty percent efficacy. And the other thing, so I coming out coming into this, I mean, I had some understanding of how this approach was going to be done. But then hearing it all summarized that way, I started to realize that a lot of people may have very unrealistic expectations about what a vaccine is going to mean. Um, Brianna, there's her this... hand up, by the way. Oh, you do? I do. What's up? You can tell that I have taught with Zoom a lot because <laughs> I'm used to the hand raise feature oh, for students. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that there's a lot of collaboration between all of the groups. Um, Rich asked a question last time when we were talking about AstraZeneca about whether the data safety monitoring boards um, were communicating with one another. Did that seem like that might be happening? It seems like that might be happening again. It was it was really the focus of this was where the status of the trials was. So it wasn't on nuts and bolts. It was just the the interaction, the interpersonal interaction between people. You got the impression that these are folks who are who are on the same team. Um, in terms of details like that, I am I am pretty sure that there's a lot of data sharing going on with that kind of thing. Um, so the the thing that occurred to me here is a lot of people have this notion that once we have a vaccine, it's all over. We pop the champagne corks. We party like it's 2019. Um, but given that everybody's aiming for protective immunity, um, it's possible we might get some vaccines or a vaccine out of all these that that gives you sterilizing immunity. But nobody's banking on that. And so it's quite likely. And what we see with recovered patients, and we've talked about reinfection cases, is that this virus itself may just give protective immunity so that people could still act as carriers. If that's the case, then a lot of the discussion people are having and a lot of the assumptions people are making around vaccines are wrong, right? Because this, for example, I've heard the notion that we should first vaccinate all the healthcare workers so they won't infect their patients. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But if right. the vaccine's giving protective immunity and they can still act as carriers, then you just turned them all into typhoid Marys. Good point. Right. So now right. it just means that they're going to be asymptomatic when they get infected. It's That's not right. going to mean that they won't give it to their patients. Yeah. Um, similarly, if people are talking about herd immunity, I think we need to just kind of table the whole notion of herd immunity because you're not going to get there with a vaccine that doesn't give you sterilizing immunity. Well, but the right. coronaviruses, the, the endemic coronaviruses infect most of the population. Yeah. And they continue to circulate even despite that. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so based I, on, I, yeah. I, I just feel like uh, I have felt for a while that the 
we almost need a new vocabulary because yeah. there is something kind of like herd immunity in that. Let me see. In the uh, I recently called it something like uh, uh, population scale uh, immune mediated disease resistance. <laughs> if you okay? define what you're talking about with herd immunity, it's fine. If you say we're talking about disease, not infection, that's okay, right? I think it can be yeah. built into the term. But if you, but if there, there are a lot of people who think of herd immunity as, oh, once we vaccinate eighty percent of the public, then the virus will just go extinct. Yeah, and that's right. I've seen yeah. no evidence yeah. to support that. And now with these companies presenting how their how their vaccines are going, um, I see evidence against that notion. As you know, Alan, we have widespread herd immunity against polio, yet it continues to reproduce in the intestines yeah. of most of the world. Right. Right. So, yes, I think that's an important point that people – we should encourage people to change their thinking about yes. herd. It doesn't – you have to define whether you're talking about infection or disease. And in this case, it's disease, right? Yes. Go ahead. So, the other thing about healthcare workers is that they, they are the people that should be tested every day. Yes. In addition, they should be vaccinated first. Yes. You put so those two should, things together, right. you're okay. They should – the healthcare workers definitely should be vaccinated first just on the basis of their risk. So to save themselves. Yeah, yeah. But the notion that that's going to protect their patients is misplaced. Yeah. We can't imagine that testing is just going to go away. Right. No, I think I think we are. Um, this mm. discussion of a new normal is quite reasonable. There are things that are not going to be possible and not going to be the same post coronavirus for for years because um, we'll still have this virus circulating and anybody who's not vaccinated or if the vaccine is not perfectly efficacious, you know, the other thing to consider is 80% efficacy preventing serious disease means 20% non-efficacy at preventing serious disease. That's right. Which could actually be a real problem, right? I mean, you roll the 10-sided yeah, die and you got to get a right. three or higher to save versus COVID. You know, that's... <laughs> That's not horrible odds, but it's not really something right. I want to be doing. Um, did, did they say how they were defining sort of serious disease? It again, this is these were top level summaries, so they didn't right. get into the details. The, the clinicaltrials.gov would be the source for how their <coughs> how their endpoints are are measured. But they're I'm sure they're looking at hospitalization, at uh, who goes on the ventilator, at, at obviously deaths. Um, so you know if if these work out and we get vaccines that keep everybody out of the hospital and keep 80% of them from even developing a cough, then that's great. Um, but that's going to be, those are going to be numbers to watch. Yeah. Like an animal, an animal experiment, they must have some sort of clinical score or something yes. like that. Yes. Um, okay. So all the vaccines that um, were discussed are going to be two dose regimens. Merck is working on a um, on an attenuated vaccine that they think might have good single dose efficacy, but they're still getting ready for phase one. So they're uh, they're not sure about that. All the others um, are are looking at two dose regimens. And for the record, AstraZeneca, which we're not there, is a one dose regimen. Yes. Um, so everybody is seeking full approval, but they are expecting that emergency use approval will come along the way. And the I know we talked about, you know, would you get a vaccine that's only been approved for emergency use? Um, after this call, I'm thinking I might, depending on what the phase three data look like, because some of these trials, uh, several of these trials are planning a two-year safety follow-up. So they actually won't be officially done and probably won't have the final, final approval until 2022. So if you want a coronavirus vaccine in 2021, you probably are getting one on an emergency use or, you know, very close to it. Um, so that's something to consider. But they, the emergency use should come 2021 for at least a few vaccines. 
No, so, Alan, did they mention right. anything about Europe or, let's say, Russia or China? Where that was not, no. Are they, these on? are, um, so this was a U.S. focused discussion. That's what I thought. So, um, so. Yeah. And these are all companies that are going to be or that are running trials in the U.S. and yeah. planning on FDA approval. So, all of their clinical trials are inside the United States, period. Well, no, there are um, some, some, like, uh, but, right. Some of these, some of these are doing trials in the U.S. and also elsewhere. Right. So right. that's pretty typical. It doesn't sound so the like danger is that some other country will announce they have a vaccine and they're going to vaccinate all of their citizens. You, you should see the airplanes that will fill up with passengers trying to go to that country. I, to don't, get I don't know about that. Would you well, would you hop on a plane to Moscow to get your not to Moscow. vaccine? No, I wouldn't go to no Moscow. Way. I wouldn't go to Moscow. But um, I, I would go to Belgium. I would go to France. I'd I would go, go to Wuhan, England. though. I'd go to Wuhan. Yeah, I'd Wuhan. Go there. I'd do go a podcast. Wuhan. <laughs> um, so, Alan, I mean, there was no indication that a EUA would come before the end of the year. There was okay. So, I was going to get to timelines All right, at fine. the end of this, Go but ahead. well, yeah, you can wait. Um, it's fine. So, everything, um, yeah. So, an EUA could come by the end of the year. It's possible. Um, everything that was being talked about, everybody's talking about shipping initially in multi-dose vials which was very important to the audience on this particular call because it's a bunch of people who go that actually stick the needles in the arms. They're immunizers. They, they do your flu shot. Um, the Several of these use adjuvants, um, and that will require mixing the adjuvant and the vaccine at the site of administration. This is not a problem at all in the U.S. or in Europe or in other developed countries. It is a potentially serious issue in poor countries. Because then you need somebody who's a trained immunizer delivering the shot to be able to mix them. Um, they um, they do eventually all plan to get to pre-filled single-dose syringes, but they're not doing that initially because demand is going to be so huge that they just don't have enough syringes, I think. So that's the plan. Um, everybody on the call is scaling up for immense levels of production. And even by their usual standards, and I, I, like 100 million doses a year levels of production for just this vaccine. Uh, Sanofi, which is the world's leading provider of flu vaccines, 100 million do doses is like an ordinary flu season for them. So they're planning to scale up to a billion. Um, there, <laughs> people are building entirely new facilities for this stuff. It's it's bonkers. Um, but it's all and it's all getting done on speculation because we're putting, as I've said before, defense department department amounts of money into vaccine development. So the companies don't have to pay for the facility. They're going to go ahead and build it before the phase two even starts, um, which means that when we do get phase three results, we should they'll they'll already have doses in vials and probably be able to ship pretty quickly after that. I'm shaking my head. I'm sorry. I've said this 10,000 times. If we had invested a fraction of this before, yes. we wouldn't have had to do this. Is this yes. ridiculous or what? Yeah. <sighs> Learn a lesson, people. And I was yeah. just thinking about what this could mean in 10, 20 years when we have all of these extra vaccine facilities. Does this mean that we are going to be extra good at making all sorts of vaccines. Or are we going to have a whole lot of farms. dusty equipment sitting around? Yeah. We're going to turn them into vertical right. farms. Use them like, the, right like the abandoned shopping malls. Yeah. yeah. They're going to convert them into shopping malls. You'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 Or indoor farms. Yes. Right. Well, that's what I just said. Come yeah. on. Well, you don't talk enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, you're right on that. <laughs> So, and everybody, as I said, is looking at at global distribution of these, although I have my own opinions about which of these vaccines will do better in that environment. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of the very important point, a lot of these platforms, in fact, I think all of these platforms have been tested already in humans before the pandemic. Yeah. So the reason all these companies are up in the lead is that they had these platforms like Moderna has tested vaccines in thousands of people already for other indications. Um, and all these companies are pretty much in the same boat. So these are these are tested platforms. The ones that use adjuvants, they're using tested adjuvants. There's no wacky new stuff going on, except that they're putting the spike protein for SARS-CoV-2 into all. And that's pretty much the standard for everybody's vaccine is, uh, you know, we've got this portion of spike or we made these modifications of spike or it's all it's all about spike. Um, there's been a lot of discussion of storage. The. Um, 
Oh, and by the way, some of these platforms have been deployed in actual vaccines in use, like the Ebola virus vaccines. We've talked about those. Uh, the mRNA vaccines are the most fragile. Um, Pfizer, Moderna, and one of so uh, Sanofi's vaccines, Sanofi's actually developing two, um, are mRNA. And they require anywhere from minus 70 to minus 20 Celsius for shipping. Pfizer says minus 70, uh, Moderna and Sanofi say minus 20. But those are all okay to go at refrigerator temperatures from the final distributor to the pharmacy. So as long as they're going to be dosed within a few days, they can sit in the fridge. So you don't have to have a minus 70 in, any, in every pharmacy, but you do have to have minus 70 through the whole distribution chain, which, as we've talked about before, could be, could be a challenge. Um, however, all of the mRNA folks are saying that these are conservative estimates based on what they know will work. And they're in the process of testing the longevity of the vaccines at higher temperatures. I have a so spare minus get to a 70 point. if you want to buy it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they could get to a point where these can be shipped uh, at refrigerated. You know, it, it may not require. And Pfizer in particular was saying, yeah, we went with minus 70 because we know that works. But we're hoping to get to minus 20 and, you know, be with everybody else on that. Um, the the other vaccines are easier to store. Um the protein-based ones, and that's Novavax, Medicago, Sanofi's other vaccine, uh, as well as Merck's attenuated virus, those are all refrigerator vaccines, two to eight degrees Celsius, so very standard, just like shipping your flu vaccine, I think. A um, whole bunch of vaccines go that way. The one I thought was really cool is Inovio. Um, they have this DNA-based vaccine platform that they've tested out for um, HPV in the past. It's basically they inject a plasmid and it's kind of like the RNA vaccines. It expresses the antigen. Um, this thing can be stored at 37 C for two months. And and 25 C, that's room temperature for over a year. So it's just naked DNA, nothing else. It's just yep. it's I think they've done something to it to to help keep it preserved. But it, it's basically just you're getting a plasmid as far as I can tell. And you can let it sit around I, I as as they were talking about this i was like this is going to be the answer if that if that vaccine works out um that's going to be great for a lot of poor countries where they can't maintain a cold chain unfortunately dna vaccines have not worked yes in humans anyway they work in horses but yeah we'll see um well inovio inovio has some promising data from the hpv stuff that they've done um, but they've never gotten this far. And so this is a big ask. Yeah. Um, be great if it works though. Um, with nine companies now up at this stage, a very important note that had not occurred to me before, but nobody's cross testing. What if you get one shot of one and another shot of the other? So all these two dose regimens, you will have to get the second shot of what you got the first shot of. And that means if uh, Pfizer comes out and they're the first vaccine approved and you rush out and you get it under the emergency use approval, and then two weeks later, somebody else comes out with one that's got better efficacy data and gee, you'd rather get that one, too bad. You made your choice. You got to go get the second dose of the Pfizer one. Um, not that Pfizer's will be bad. That's just an example. It's just, so whichever one you commit to initially is the one you're going to have to stick with. And I'm, I don't know... There wasn't any discussion of, and I didn't, the, the question and answer was jam-packed. I didn't manage to get to ask this, but whether there are plans for tracking that. Like somebody goes and gets shot number one, and um, then they show up for shot number two, and the, the vaccinator says, well, which one did you get first? Well, I got the COVID vaccine. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so then what do you do? And and I assume somebody's thinking about that besides me. So hopefully that'll get straightened out to some extent. Yeah. I kind of wonder when you say kind of you have to get the dose sort of how, Who's, how is that enforced and how is. Yeah, I, I think. Why can't you be like, well, give me four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll take. Yeah. I'll, well, then I'll take the first dose of the other one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. One now and one to go. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll, um, so we have some emails about that, about that coming up that are quite interesting, actually. Okay. 
Yeah. The, the real point is that they are not testing for what happens if you do that. And so you'd be, um, you know, as we say in aviation, you become the test pilot. Um, so if you, if you feel lucky and you want to go ahead and do that, then, um, uh, let's see other stuff there. Everybody is trying to at least trying to include diverse populations by age, obviously, because with this disease, that's a huge deal, but also, also ethnicity. Um, they're focusing on groups that have disproportionate disease burdens, even if that's not biologically based. Um, African-Americans are a population that everybody would like to include plenty of. And in fact, Moderna, um, their CEO even mentioned that they their recruitment has slowed because they are now actively looking to increase the number of African-Americans they've enrolled. They don't feel they have enough of them. Um, so that brings me to timelines, which was actually really enlightening. Um, as of Monday, Pfizer had enrolled over 25,000 people in their in their plan, 30,000 subject phase three trial. Impressive. It's very impressive. <laughs> this started like a month ago. Yeah. Um, Moderna had 21,000. As I say, they've slowed recruitment because they're aiming for demographic inclusion, but still 21,000 already. That's also going to be 30,000. 30,000 seems to be kind of the, the standard number for the phase two, three. Um, Pfizer vaccine is two doses, 21 days apart. Moderna's is two doses, 28 days apart. Um, the hmm. efficacy clock starts 10 days after the second dose. That's important because if you give somebody the first dose and then they go out and they catch SARS-CoV-2 and they get sick, does that count in your efficacy stats? Well, the answer is no. No. Nope. Not until not until ten days after their second dose. Mm. So um, then, of course, reporting dates are going to depend on how many people get infected in the the experimental and control. So I did I did a quick uh, back of the envelope type of um, something's beeping again. I don't know what is beeping. Um, I don't hear, hear it. It's okay, okay it's it. definitely it's definitely on my end, and I don't know what it is. Um, it's no problem, Mr. So, Jones. You're yes. running out of fuel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's maybe the gear is not down. I, um, anyway, so um, uh, yeah, so Pfizer is two doses, 21 days apart. Moderna's is two doses, 28 days apart. Efficacy clock starts 10 days after the second dose. And then they have to wait for people to, to acquire infections, and that'll determine when they can report data. So I did a quick back of the envelope calculation here for an absolute best case, because these are the two vaccines with AstraZeneca pause, those are the two vaccines that are in the lead. If they, if Pfizer gives their second dose at the end of September, if they've got everybody enrolled or, or enough enrolled, they give the second dose to end of September. Moderna's second dose would be beginning of October because they've got a week more before their, their second dose. Efficacy, clo efficacy clocks would start for those two companies around mid-October, separated by about a week. And then bear in mind a complete infection course for COVID-19 is at least a month. So I certainly wouldn't trust data that come out before about mid-November um, because they can't, as far as I can tell, I mean, unless I'm misreading something, um, and this is all a bit above my pay grade, but it, it seems inconceivable that they could have enough data before mid-November to, to say it really works and it doesn't make the disease worse because that's something you're going to be looking for. And, it, and if you see good preliminary results, hey, fewer people got infected, but then two weeks later you see, oh, half of the ones who did get infected died, um, then that's not such a great vaccine, right? Um, however, Pfizer's CEO has said, uh, and I provided a link to one of the news stories about this, he expects a clinical answer about whether or not the vaccine works on efficacy by the end of October. I, I don't know. So both, um, uh, both Ralph last week and Daniel earlier said we need 200 infections to distinguish. Okay, yeah. and, and, but you, know, you need those 200 infections to run their course. So the right, CEO I, basically is saying efficacy, but we're not going to know if people die, as you say, yeah. in that first round. No. 
and he and he did clarify after the remarks that he's not talking about approval by then. He's talking about enough data to say whether it works. Um, right, so, and I'm so. not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what the basis of that would be. Um, the worst thing that could happen with something like this would be a Dengvaxia type of story, yeah, right? The, Where you, they approved a, a vaccine and yeah. set it out, and then it actually made the disease worse. And they found out much know. later. But Alan, um, was I going to ask you? I don't know. Why not? You don't know what I was going to I don't know either, Vincent. I have a question. Go ahead. Ask. <laughs> Dixon will fill the dead air. Oh, I'm sure I will. <laughs> so we already have a vaccine that we give out every year. It's a flu vaccine. Yes. And we have death rates as a result of yes. flu epidemics. Um, the, the way in which we calculate whether the flu vaccine had any effect at all. Tell me how that figures into their current thinking about this vaccine. Okay. So flu vaccine is complicated. Because again, there's yeah, also this debate about infection versus protection. True. And there have been a number of studies that have done it one way and a number of studies that have done it another way. And if you look at uh, infection, the flu vaccine usually sucks. Right. Uh, if you look at protection, it's usually pretty yes. good. And so there's this ongoing debate. Well, it's only 30% efficacious against infection but it's 80% efficacious against landing in the hospital. So you okay. get your flu shot. Um, we have a number of uh, uh, emails in the queue uh, that uh, address this very thing. And it's uh, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is the the sort of population scale um, observational way of evaluating the influenza vaccine is to look at the number of influenza virus uh, cases that are reported and then score them for whether or not they had been vaccinated. Yes. Okay. And that's how you test, uh, and then to apply a bunch of statistics and that's how you test whether it was effective. So, uh, if you're going to do the same sort of thing here, we're talking about the same sort of population scale, uh, uh, analysis of, um, documented, COVID-19 cases and whether or not you were vaccinated. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But for flu, you've got 20 to 30 to 40,000 deaths every year. Mm -hmm. We should know whether those well, not people every were year. vaccinated or not. Depends on yeah. the season. Yeah. It's not always oh. 40,000. It's right. No, no, no. I said I said from 20 to 40. So right. whenever you got from that five, number, It's from 5 to 40, Dixon. So tell me that do we keep track of all those people as to whether or not they were vaccinated. That's all I'm asking. No, yeah. not all of them. No. Yeah. The, the records are a mess there. There's a lot of discussion. In fact, if you join the national um, uh, adult and influenza immunization summit and you get their emails, you will find that <laughs> right. there's, a, there's a lot of discussion around vaccine registries and how to get them implemented and how to get them better implemented. And, um, yes, we would love to have those kinds of data for flu vaccine. Uh, have that's, the same that's, problem a, that's a big reason why these trials are planned to go longer than mm. just the initial approval. So I remembered my question. So these data, they're coming in. So the, the, the study is blinded, right? Right. So nobody knows the code. But all we know is that people are coming in, they're getting tested, and we see the number of infections ticking up in group A and B. We don't know which is which, right? And so right. at what point do they decide Let's break the code when it gets to 200 or what? I, I don't know. I, I assume that that's been set in the trial protocol and it's probably based on number of infections. Okay. And it's probably something like when we have 200 infections in each group or, or 200 infections in one group, then we can unblind okay. it. Um, Got it. And I don't know if uh, Pfizer's CEO was basing this claim on what he expects from that and what they've seen so far or, uh, okay. uh, I don't know. Got it. And what does that do to the trial? Okay. So once can you, you un unblind it, yes. Can you, can you unblind no it? a trial? <laughs> can you unblind it to a, a, a no. mm, compassionate use. contained set of individuals somehow? I mean, and continue the no. trial or no, no you're yeah. done. It right? is then, it is then un unblinded. However, um, you still haven't, you probably haven't disclosed to the people who, the subjects, which vaccine, they, which shot yeah. they got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but if you um, unblind and you find that it's working, you now have to give it to everybody. You now yeah, have to right. give it to everybody. That is, that yes. is correct. 
That is right. correct. And so, so it Alan, does it does raise some thorny issues with that if they unblind prematurely and then make decisions on that basis, then are we still doing science? Uh, are they are they making sure that the same thing doesn't happen this time that happened with the flu vaccine recording so that you're absolutely sure of when you got that vaccine and which vaccine that's going to, I'm sure that's going to be as patchwork as the other, um, as the other registry issues. I, I just, I don't have a great feeling about that. That's going to be, that's going to be at the state level and at the pharmacy level and CVS, yeah, will, CVS have their exactly, and Walgreens will have exactly. theirs and Massachusetts will have theirs and Texas will have theirs and everybody will use a different format. And I, I I'm not optimistic about that being tracked. Right Does any other country have a better system for the same vaccines that now exist? Does any other country not have a better system? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> a better system. <laughs> uh, I, many other countries have better systems for tracking. Yeah, like I think, um, in fact, the way we the, the way it disproved that vaccination causes autism was to One use the them. Dutch study. Yes. Right? The Dutch have extremely good The Dutch have keeping. registries. That I'm sure all the Scandinavian countries are good with registries. Yeah, that's right. The, Germany, the UK, France. I think, has a registry. All the European So what's up pretty. with us? That is a much larger discussion. It's <laughs> <laughs> not for Twitter. That's, question, That's <laughs> not this week in virology anymore. Uh, it's just this week. <laughs> Remember the show that was the week that was? That was Maybe very that's good, uh, should... Alan. By the way, thank you so much. It's really yeah. absolutely that's absolutely. Awesome, Alan. Uh, Our guest has so been Alan, Alan Dove. Have... <laughs> hey. So Alan, I have another I have another question. You said that these are the uh, nine companies that are oh, basically yeah. the leaders in this whole thing. Uh, I'm trying to relate that to um, uh, products uh, being supported by or advanced by Operation Warp Speed. I, okay? uh, yeah. And so if I, uh, I've tried to do this recently to summarize it, and it was a little hard to figure out who's in Warp Speed. The best I could come, actually, uh, was a Wikipedia. Yeah. Okay? that identified nine companies that had warp speed products. And then I went and got the WHO landscape document and found those companies. And basically they correlate with, uh, they correlate with companies that have products that are in late phase two or phase three trials. Yeah. Okay. I think so these, I can kind of make some assumptions and figure out what the products. Are. Yeah. I, th I think it's the same group or a very closely overlapping group with this. Okay. And, and several people on the call were talking about their, you know, thanks to operation warp speed support. Uh, Barda has also been heavily involved in this since the beginning. They're supporting pretty much everybody uh, and Bill and Melinda Gates foundation and some other sources as well. Is WHO tracking the total number of vaccine trials going on throughout the world? Other people are. Who? Milken Institute. I meant who? Milken WHO. Institute. Uh, the, the WHO has this has this uh, lands draft landscape of vaccines document that's updated every day. How many okay. different companies are working on this worldwide? I don't though? know how many different companies, but there's like 150 more products. Well, there's more than that. More than that. Uh, that's 200. Incredible. That's incredible. And that's what that's I wanted like, to ask like Alan. A, so we have over 200 vaccines in all kinds of developmental stages. So let's say three, four, five, make it, they're used. What happens to all the others? Do they stop or what? Maybe they would be better. Who knows, right? Yeah, maybe they would be better. And this was something that occurred to me during uh, the Merck presentation because they're technically in last place, although they're saying, um, what was their, um, they are expecting to get both into phase one by the end of the year. Um, and they're going to hope to have phase three underway sometime next year. What's their platform? Uh, again, it's this ridiculous speed thing. And um, what had me hopeful about the, the Merck vaccine is it's the only one in the group that's a, um, that's an, a, an active attenuated vaccine. How are they doing that? Uh, actually, well, they, I ha they actually I have, have two. Um, so one is a VSV SARS-CoV-2 um, chimeric, and the other is a measles virus chimeric. So they're spike. The VSV only. one is the same platform as the Ebola vaccine. Okay. Right. VSV Delta G. But they're just and the spike. measles one is based on the Schwartz measles strain that's been in the measles shot for decades. So like a billion people have had that in their arm already. So these are both spike based. 
Yes. So they're not, yeah, pretty, they're not, they're pretty not, much ten, they're not attenuated. They're vectored vaccines, really. They're right. vectored. I'm yeah. sorry. But they're, they are, they are Infectious. live virus. Yeah, 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 got it. Okay. <laughs> they're active virus. They're replicating. So um, I think Vincent's uh, comment is really relevant here with regards to the winners. Once there are winners. Yes. What's going to happen to the uh, promulgation of to those the, vaccines? Is WHO going to buy them all and then distribute them for free? What's going to happen? No. Um, so, so to back to Vincent's point, the reason this came up for me with the Merck vaccine was I thought I, I really liked their approach and I thought, wow, that'd be, that'd be cool. Except that if five of these others are approved by then, yeah. they may not have any customers, you know, especially exactly. if, if some of the others can be shipped under the same ambient conditions and then what are you going to do? I mean, they're mm-hmm. Merck, they'll, they'll do fine. But, um, but a lot of the other companies that weren't on the call that are still working on these that are hoping to get into phase one next year, um, are probably just going to be left in the lurch. Uh, the, the saving grace there is that they're generally not investing their own money or their stockholders' money. Right, that's right. So they're, this is being financed by the taxpayers, as it should be. That's right. And so they won't be out of business, you know, because they were 10th right. in line for the right. for the yeah. vaccine. I, I would think that, you know, you said that they're making huge amounts, but that's those huge amounts were 100 million doses per year. That's not a huge yes. amount. And so <laughs> if you start thinking about how many people there are and how many yes. doses are needed... Even those are even we're probably going to need quite a few vaccines before we can actually cover everyone. Yes, that was as I as I was saying that somebody's going to call me on this. Um, (laughs) True, But Um, if the vaccine works the way you hope it will, maybe there will be enough, quotes, unquote, herd immunity at some point to protect the rest of those people until they get vaccinated. Maybe. Yeah, um, that's the hope. I think the, that is their hope. I, more likely what's going to happen is we'll have three or four companies next year who are producing at the 100 million dose a year level, and we'll get everybody vaccinated or hopefully everybody, close to everybody right. vaccinated. Um, and then they'll be able to keep pumping those out and s- shipping them to everybody else. And the Sanofi figure, obviously, at a billion doses a year they they actually are accustomed to vaccinating a whole country in a year, um, so I'm pr- I'm pretty optimistic on that. And yeah. is NIH right. ramping up their budgets in that direction? Um, well, they it depends get, on who's in charge of the country. They put <laughs> yeah. NIH you know? put what eight hundred million into coronavirus research, yeah. so they're slowly doling yeah. that out. And I'm oh, I, I, I want to I'm happy to say we got a little bit of that recently. We just got a SARS CoV two grant. Um, to to uh, do some fundamental stuff, which is immuno- immunology based, actually. Right. Um, but but many other um, and someday we'll talk about it. And many other uh, labs would like to do that, but they're not giving it out freely, which is good. They're a little stingy, which is good because you don't want everyone That's coming it. to the water trough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this uh, little report of Alan's together with uh, with uh, Daniel's earlier is a good uh, little primer on the vaccine situation. Vaccine situation, yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks again, Alan. That's great. Sure. Happy to do it. We should have you on again sometime to- Yes, I, maybe I can come on the show. <laughs> give us an update. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, I have a few brevia. The first came from Joe, who wrote a, such a cool email that I had to just mention this paper. <laughs> yeah. She wrote, "Bugger, even the snapping turtles." <laughs> and she sent. Uh, can I can I make a correction here? This is coming from Australia, so the word is "bugger." <laughs> bugger, that's right, bugger. I thought you were going to say they're not snapping turtles, but it's in the title. Yeah, how do you say it again? Bugger, bugger, bugger. And, bugger and what does it bugger mean? All. What does it mean? In, in the uh, way it depends. It's yeah. Um, it, let's not go this, there. Depends on how you want to. No, this situation. She's even the point. snapping turtle. Darn, even the snapping turtles. Yes. Right? Yes. Ah. Exactly. Exactly. Dixon, your mind is in the gutter. Go. <laughs> so this is a plus one paper, actually from 2018, but very interesting. Identification of a novel nidovirus as a potential cause of large scale mortalities in the endangered Bellinger River snapping turtle. Mutkelis georgesi, some out of Australia. I have to say, reading this paper, 
took me back to pre-pandemic TWIV. Dad, that's what I and, put it and in it here. Made it? Long, it made me long for it, and it was delightful. Yeah, that's why I put oh, it the in. days when we could talk about non-coronaviruses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other neetoviruses, not to mention, you know, all the rest of them. Yeah, but of course, you know, right. viruses infecting... You know, turtles for turtles. crying out loud. Yes. So right. that's why uh, Joe sent it because we had mentioned last time that there are nidoviruses of insects, right? And now she says, bugger, even the snapping turtles. Mm -hmm. So this is a interesting, um, this is river snapping turtle, freshwater turtle, rare restricted habitat. It, to, it lives solely in a 60 kilometer part of this river and an adjacent one in New South Wales, and it had been undergoing a large number of deaths um, in 2015. And so Australia went and investigated this multi-agency investigation, over 400 dead or dying animals, uh, and they sampled them and tried to find out what was killing them. And they said, we didn't have any toxins, we didn't find any bacteria, trichomonas, chlamydia, nothing. So we said, and the last thing is, so let's look for a virus. <laughs> After we rule everything else out, right? Um, so they took um, they took samples from these turtles who had died, and they inoculated them into buffalo African green monkey kidney cells. Okay, which you would think is kind of distant from turtles, but maybe there aren't so many turtle cell lines. I just don't know. Um, and they got They're slow growing. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the, but they eventually win the race. Yes. The key word here, and we'll get to it, is kidney. Kidney. Huh. Right. Kidney. So they had homogenous. Okay, that turns out to be important. Spleen and lung tissues. And they got cytopathic effects on the cell, lytic destruction of the cells. They could passage. They take the supernatant and infect fresh cells. Uh, and they um, they see cytopathic effect. Now, they well, did. For the new listeners, cytopathic effect means that you look at the cells in a microscope and they look really sick. They don't look normal. They're rounded up or there's or they're coming apart or something like that. It's cool because you you can't see the virus unless you do electron microscopy, and not everybody does that. But you can see what it does to the cells, and you can see that easily in a microscope. And and, and, and it's I can I can imagine these guys, these people. Uh, putting this stuff in culture and coming back and seeing a cytopathic effect and going, bugger! <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. In fact, that's what happened back in January when they took some lung aspirates from these pneumonia patients in Wuhan. They stuck them on, I think it was Vero cells. I think it was. And the next day, two days later, they see cytopathic effects. I can imagine what they said, right? Oh, look right. at this. And then they sequenced it and they got a virus. So, that's right. But and then what, they said, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, that's Not right. all. <laughs> and then, but what's interesting is they inoculated these supernatants onto, so they got Vero cells, they, they're cytopathic in Vero cells, but not in hamster, avian, fish, reptile, or mosquito cell lines. Including reptile. Wow. Reptile. So reptile. it's very odd, right? That's amazing. So it's a mammalian cell. Two mammalian but were cell those lines. reptile cell lines kidney? I don't think so. That's the deal. Yeah, because the the as you go through this, the sort of major apparently target organ, it's the kidney. one that that uh, that sees the most damage is the kidney. They speculate on hmm. uh, maybe the the key here for the cultured cells is kidney. Now that's interesting to think about. It's still that interesting. Kidney from a, a very unrelated yeah. unrelated vertebrate has some sort of yeah. characteristic. Yeah, <clears throat> that uh, contributes susceptibility to the virus. Yeah, that must. I was surprised that it's you know phylogenetically distant, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the other thing with these cell lines is there's, and I don't know about this particular one, but there's a lot of cell lines that are deficient in uh, innate responses of one sort or another. Okay, that make them more permissive. And whether this particular cell line is one of those, I don't know. Yeah, it would be interesting. Also Go ahead. No, earlier that. Um, when they looked in those areas of the river, there were um, some sort of other uh, turtles that mm -hmm. were in some cases closely related and none of them had disease. Yeah. Um, and so that also kind of indicated that this might have some interesting um, and tight tropism. What they didn't do is try human cells, which I think would be interesting yeah. because you can imagine that if this virus does replicate in human cells, these turtles are isolated. They never encounter people. What if they did? 
could it infect people, right? We know that these coronas can uh, can go from <laughs> non-human animals to people. Anyway, they called it Bellinger River virus. And my my suspicion is there aren't anyone, there's no no one living near this river. Otherwise, they would have objected to naming the virus after it. Um, and so that's it. Well, um, since it's a turtle virus, people might be a little more lenient about that. Could be that, it, yes, it's not going to have any bad associations. They have uh, they have electron micrographs of this thing. So very cool, uh, and and it's uh, they call it uh, Bacilliform. Yes, there are several. Uh, the uh, I'm, I'm is it Nido or Nido or Nido virales? Well, the the, the Nido virus meeting is called the Nido virus. Okay, meeting, but I, I so call Nido it virales that's an order. And it has several families in it. Yeah. Coronaviruses are one family. Right. I don't know how this is going to uh, uh, sort out family-wise, but some of the families in the uh, order Nidovirales uh, have different shapes, different forms. Yeah, and this looks cool. like, I forget which it is, but this looks like it's different than the nice round coronavirus. Mm -hmm. It is, they call it bacilliform. It's, um, well, it looks like a bacteria. Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's very nice looking. Yes. Yeah. And they it's say- It's bad that they go with Nido uh, viralis because I just think that Nido virus is- Yes. <laughs> yes, I've, I've well, always preferred it okay, as Nido good virus. Point. Well, maybe okay. that's Thank the way that- Thank me that I mean, pun attempt. <laughs> Nido or Nido. Yeah, Nito is cool. Maybe that's the right way. I'm just, I may not be remembering. It's, They're all Nido. <laughs> uh, this, the closest uh, is the ball python Nido virus. Which we taught, which was discovered by Mark Stengline when he was in Joe DeRisi's lab, and Mark and Joe were on yeah. Twiv to talk about that some time ago. Remember? That's mm -hmm. right. Ball python nidovirus. Uh, so yeah, they sequence the genome. They find it in various tissues, and is it rich prev mostly in in uh, kidney? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's where most of the uh, pathology was in mm -hmm. the uh, turtles. That was seemed to be perhaps the target organ. Kidney lesion showed similar yeah, staining in areas. Okay. The uh, the family that is bacilliform that I'm aware of in the I'm gonna I, I'm I'm with you, Brian, in the nidovirus in the nidovirus order is uh, Roni or Roni virus R O N I. So they're, they, you know, they have in common some, some phylogenetic relationship, but, uh, that they make these subgenomic nested subgenomic RNAs. That's what brings them all together under the, uh, Nido virus family. And it's lovely to know that there's a Nido Roni virus. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, the phylogenet the phylogeny that puts them, clusters them with a bunch of snake viruses. I think this is fascinating. Did any, uh, uh, any guesses well, leads, how they're transmitted? Well, it leads, uh, yes, they think that they're, you know, they pick it up in the water, okay, orally. But the the notion that it clusters with a bunch of snake viruses makes them think that this is a spillover mm -hmm. from snakes into the turtles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? So from the turtles' perspective, this is a zoonosis. Right. And the right? turtles are probably wishing they had worked on this and they could have prevented it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but they kept it under their shell. So Dixon, do you uh, see turtles when you fish? Yeah, sure. So you could get infected from a turtle virus, Dixon. You should be careful. I promise not to eat them. But you do wear waders, right? You don't go in. I do. I do. Okay. Yes, I do. But you, you, and you, you could walk across uh, the uh, lake, the river in Austin on the turtles. <laughs> They're yeah, lousy with them. You know what? Really? It's a it's a southern yeah. uh, delicacy. Snapping turtle, the alligator snapping turtle is, is caught for food, and sometimes there are fifty and sixty pound animals. So uh, it's not a trivial uh, thought to think that this could spill over into humans. <laughs> I wanted to. So just, the way uh, I read this article, it looked like they were uh, at their they were endangered. Yeah. Before this. Yeah. Now there were only extinct. about <laughs> there were only about forty five hundred of them, and oh, now wow. they're thinking maybe there's uh, it it sounds to me the way i read it as if this virus may have uh killed like 90 percent of them so i thinking but they yeah. they say they can't prove it they say unfortunately as this is now a critically endangered species we can't 
undertake experimental transmission to fulfill Koch's postulates. Uh, nevertheless, you know, there's a modern form of Koch's postulates from Fredericks and Relman. Uh, new Koch's postulates. New Koch's postulates. Actually, it's Koch, right? Koch. Koch, yes. Koch. Koch. Christian Drosten did it for us. Uh, so you isolate the virus from tissues of diseased animals. You find high levels of viral RNA in tissues with marked pathological changes. In situ hybridization demonstrates the presence of specific viral RNA in lesions from kidneys and eye tissues, which are two of the main affected organs. No or very low levels of RNA in normal animals. And so those are kind of the modern Koch's, Koch's postulates. Okay. And that's a, that's a nice take home from this paper. Yeah, I, I uh, feel like I'm, I feel pretty confident that this virus causes this disease. Yeah. And I'm sorry about the I'm sorry about the turtles. Yeah. Well, the yeah, other thing awful. I wanted to say was that if you go to Southeast Asia or or China, they eat turtles all the time. And we do too in New Orleans and south in the southern part of the United States, uh turtle soup is a big deal. So uh, they also have some speculation as to, you know, why now, of course, that you don't know, but uh, a lot of their answers imply climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, increasing water temperatures resulting in, say, decreased turtle immunity or decrease yeah. or increased survivability of the virus, all sorts of things like that. There you My go, answer to a question like that these days is because it's 2020. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Brianne. So, Rich, the reason why I asked it was because whether or not it was... Um, um, now I lost my train of thought. All right, you wait until I'm finished. <laughs> Brienne, now you, maybe you should become an expert in turtle immunity. I, I could. <laughs> I, I would be fine with that. So, you know, it's Slow funny. going research, though. Speaking and, of turtles, <laughs> so I went to visit Ian Lipkin the other day. And, oh, yeah, uh, how is he? He's, oh, he's, he says he loses his breath all the time. Absolutely. He says he cannot, He if he walks up a mild incline, he loses his breath. And he's trying to exercise and and build up, but he says he's still not right. And, wow. Right? So, but he said, well, anyway, he's got a, when I left, he said, come over here and have some good luck. Feed the turtles. He has two tiny turtles in a ah. terrarium, right? Just cute as anything, you know, the little green. <laughs> and so he gave me a piece of food and he said, if you feed the Chinese uh is uh, saying is if you feed a turtle, you have good luck and they wouldn't eat. <laughs> so he said, well, come well, to, you better come the, to the uh, aquarium and get some uh, good luck. By the way, if I look up the, uh, at least the um, internet definition of bugger, okay, <laughs> there is a noun and a verb definition that are R rated, but it also says as an exclamation used okay. to express annoyance or anger. So, Rich, the reason right. why I asked you about the mode of transmission was that maybe this turtle has a special diet, which included the vector or the way of transferring this from one turtle to another, whereas the others eat different things. And so they would could be. I mean, they could speculate be. it's just you know, wasn't there something in here? What was it about another species that's OK? They haven't yeah. done experimental infections. So right. 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 Yeah, and, it, and that species that was OK can actually breed with. The species that was sick. So they are oh, quite really? close. Yes. Oh, wow. Oh, wait. One more paper, which I thought was relevant based on our discussion last, was it last Friday about the immunity waning yes. to flu yeah. vaccine? No, last Friday. Um, this just came out in the previous week. It's a Med Archive preprint SARS CoV 2 specific memory B cells, frequency in recovered patients remain stable while antibodies decay over time study out of uh, Israel, and they, they took a cohort of uh, recovered, mildly infected, and recovered patients, and of course controls, and they, they took serum and blood from them, uh, multiple samples, and they measured virus SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibody. Um, 54 symptomatic, 57 recovered patients, 26 control. And what they found is that the viral antibodies rise after, so at some point after onset of symptoms, they peak, and then they begin to decline. And within months, six, months after infection, they're gone or at baseline, they're very low. But then they took blood and they looked for memory, B cells, and um, plasma blasts 
which I understand, Brianna, the precursors of plasma cells, which produce antibodies, right? They are. And the plasma blasts are also um, going to be more in the blood and mm -hmm. aren't going to necessarily have gone to the bone marrow, right. like the plasma cells we talked about in that previous paper. But could be long-lived? Um, they're usually going to be a bit shorter lived. Um, okay. Typically, the sort of effector cells in the adaptive immune system are thought of as being somewhat more short lived. Okay. And the, the, these are in the effector cell category. Exactly. Okay. But well, what they find is these uh, B memory B cells and plasma blasts are still there in six months. That's as far as they can go out after right. onset of symptoms. They're still there as opposed to the antibodies dropping. Now, they didn't look in the bone marrow, which would have been nice, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, Brienne, is it possible that in, you would find a difference in the bone marrow at six months, maybe? Or, um, maybe. Or is this an indicator um, of what's happening in the bone marrow, do you think? Th this could very well be an indicator of what's happening in the bone marrow. Um, I think in the the paper that we talked about last time, they looked at sort of responses in the blood versus responses in the bone marrow versus antibodies, and they saw um, some correlations. Um, but I think that so I think this could be somewhat reflective of what they're seeing in the bone marrow. Um, this also is sort of standard immunology um, in that we know that the idea is your antibody levels are sort of very low. They go up to some sort of peak, and then they come down to a baseline plateau. Um, and the reason why th that plateau is higher than the very beginning, and the reason why you stay at that plateau is because of some low-level production um, and some memory cells. And the reason why you can get protected upon secondary infection is because you have those memory cells around ready to make their great responses. Um, so here we're seeing you have lots of memory cells hanging out. Um, hopefully to make their great responses later. I mean, I, I think the interesting question is whether it lasts, they last longer than six months because yes. for SARS-1, Stan Perlman looked 15 years after infection and there were no more memory B cells in the blood. And so maybe 12 months or maybe longer, who knows? But yeah. they, 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 you know, they cite the, the flu paper and say, you know, this is kind of comparable to that and- in, in what we're looking at, but it's not the same, obviously. Right. One thing that's sort of interesting is they they largely are looking at um, their plasma cells uh, sort of by um, flow cytometry to sort of look at the presence of those yeah, yeah. Um, plasma cells. Um, and so I would love to see um, them take those plasma cells and actually look at their ability to um, make antibodies or to proliferate or to do different things um, upon rechallenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there have been a couple of papers, um, one really big one in cell a couple of weeks ago, talking about problems with germinal centers in COVID patients, yeah, yeah. which are where B cells sort of do some of this later development. Um, and it's saying that there are these, these uh, germinal center problems. And so I would love to see whether these uh, memory cells act like typical memory cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, they say we don't know if these if this would provide any protection against infection or not. Right. right. And an important note here, this is a med archive preprint. Yeah. Um, so some of these issues would hopefully be addressed as they move this toward a, toward a yeah. peer reviewed publication. I do hope that we'll look at, we'll see longer term studies. I'm sure we will as the months sure. pass, right. Yeah. To see if these B cells remain or if in maybe in a year they're gone or maybe in yeah. two years they're gone. Who knows? Well, this is that's another thing that I'm sure uh, the vaccine trials are going to be looking at is how long do antibodies persist? How long do uh, various uh, do T cell immunity, et cetera, and, and other plasma cells persist? Yeah. And unfortunately, the only way you can do that is to wait. There yes. isn't some sort of uh, yes. surrogate that you can measure to know whether that's going to happen. Yep. Yes. You have to be patient. That's always in science, right? Yeah, you guys agree? Yes, patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of yes. yeah. Some things just... cannot be rushed, no matter how much money you put on it. It's yeah. true. All right, let's do a couple of emails here. First one is from Charles, who sends a quote from a Washington Post article from Winston <laughs> Churchill. And you know, Daniel Griffin's been giving quotes on his little updates. Uh, a lot of Churchill quotes and others. 
And this one is, quote, the British people can face any misfortune with fortitude and buoyancy as long as they are convinced that those in charge of their affairs are not deceiving them or are not dwelling in a fool's paradise. Indeed. How appropriate. Yes. Thank you, Charles. Indeed. <laughs> you know, when we talked to Christian Drosten and talked about why Germany is doing so well, one of the things that he mentioned was uh, Angela Merkel. And he yeah. didn't have to say it, but the implication <laughs> was that people trust her. Yeah, that's true. U uniformly. Well, there's a certain right wing group in Germany that doesn't, but that's. Oh, yeah. sure. I mean, any any country is going to have that kind of a group and that's fine and yeah. normal. Yeah. But yeah. as long as they're not in charge. And, and exactly. yeah, I would I would be they used to be in charge. <laughs> I, I would want the Ph.D. chemist to be in charge of the country during the pandemic. <laughs> that's right. So. I think that's all good. Only yeah. thing that's better is perhaps a PhD virologist. Yeah, that would be but, ideal. Yes. You know, how about it? How about <laughs> an immunologist? Please? An immunologist. I would take an immunologist. Would do, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's what Tony Fauci was trying to do, right? Was to yeah. be the voice of reason. He's yeah. trying to be Still saying is. what we should do, and you know, to a certain extent, he was listened to, but not entirely. That's why Trump dragged in somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Alan, could you take the next one, please? Sure. Betsy writes, I'm a longtime listener, big fan, first-time writer. Thank you so much for the important work you do. In TWIV 660, you discussed a recent paper from Rafi Ahmed's group, which involves analysis of bone marrow aspirates. Alan Dove mentioned his wife was a bone marrow donor. Good for her. And discussed the pain involved should she decide to donate. I'm concerned that this was a very misleading discussion and that, that may actually discourage listeners from becoming donors. I wanted to write to ask you to revisit this important topic to clarify what's involved and encourage your listeners to consider joining the Bone Marrow Registry. Provides a link. Uh, importantly, many, doc many donors donate stem cells harvested from their peripheral blood rather than through a bone marrow aspirate. Uh, I actually knew that. I should have pointed that out as well. Um, you can read about the donation process here. Provides another link, and we will have these links in the notes. I know several people who have received bone marrow transplants after receiving a cancer diagnosis. Joining the registry is easy, and it may give you the opportunity to save a life. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah, I looked at the, uh, both these links are from a site called bethematch.org. Yeah. And I looked at them and they're all very good and answer uh, all of the questions. And it sounds like, you know, I think there's different ways of getting a bone marrow aspirate. Uh, if, uh, being a donor is different than just getting a diagnosis. Right. Uh, and if you're going to get a bone marrow aspirate as a donor, uh, it looks to me like that's done under general anesthesia. Okay. Uh, as a, uh, you know, in a half day, uh, thing from what I was able to read, but all the details are there. And as she points out, you can do it from peripheral blood and it's a, an important thing to do. Yeah. We don't want to discourage people from doing right. that. Yes. So our listener, we have a lot of listeners now, so we don't want to tell you things that may scare you away from doing things like this. Uh, and when we, uh, uh, importantly, and this is a good example, when we, Say something that you think needs some tweaking or correction, or if we're dead know. wrong, <laughs> let us know. And Try to be we'll, nice about it. But we'll yeah. say, we'll say, oh yeah, yes. Bone marrow donation is important. This reminds me of a, a protocol I got years ago from a scientist at Harvard. Uh, he, you know, pages and pages of molecular biology protocol, and he wrote at the end, "If you find anything wrong with this protocol, just drop dead." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I still have it. I kept it because that was so funny. Nice. <laughs> wow. Nice. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Sam writes, Dear TWIV team, 21C in San Diego tonight with a chance of Labor Day super spreader events. On episode 659, a listener's letter said new infections in China were being blamed on imported food. This is just another in the long list of examples I've seen of this bizarre impulse people have where they refuse to believe that there can be local spread in their area. I've heard so many people insist without evidence that the infections in their state or country were from people outside the community bringing it in, as if it's a matter of shame to have community spread, as if their people couldn't possibly be infectious. I've heard this enough to notice the pattern. I don't know anything about studies on the newer cases in New Zealand, but it seems that that's an example too. When I heard there were new cases there, my first instinct was to think that it had been circulating at very low levels for a while and then reached a critical mass. 
maybe only a few asymptomatic people were getting infected after the initial clampdown. Because if the new cases in New Zealand are solely due to imported infections, that means the country managed to eradicate the virus completely before, right? That seems unlikely. The null hypothesis to me seems to be that they just got their cases low enough to not be a problem, but not low enough to drive the virus extinct on these islands. And now it's risen back up. All the best, Sam. Uh, I agree completely, Sam. Um, I think that there is... And in fact, if you look at sort of the history of infectious disease, which is something I spent a lot of time thinking about as an undergraduate, um, there is this idea of health being tied to being a good person. And so oh. um, it's we can't have infections here because we're good people. Um, we're clean. Yes, yeah. we're clean. We're not those kind of people. Yeah. Um, so I think that this impulse um, is a, a scene in a lot of places and it's something that we need to you know get past. I think the New Zealand thing, it's, I, I'd put even odds on either scenario. It's, it was a long time that they had zero infections. And so the hypothesis that it was circulating silently in a country that was being diligent about testing, maybe, um, but it seems just as possible to me that there, that there was a screw up at the border and somebody brought it. So I, I think in their case, I might make some allowances, but a lot of these others, like um, people saying, oh, you know, Maine is having their cases go up because the tourists came in. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure it was all the tourists who brought that. I, I have the same sort of uh, thoughts, Alan, but at, at the same time, my thought is it doesn't really matter. No, of course not. Because I think, you know, there's, a, I don't know what people are thinking here uh, <laughs> as if, as if. Uh, I mean, because you're not going to outrun this thing. No, I don't think. Uh, maybe, no, I mean, maybe, of, maybe you can eradicate it from your island, but it's gonna it's gonna get back uh, unless you are going to cut off all communication with the rest of the world. It's going to get back in. It's going to get back in. Um, I mean, while it's gone, you can you can enjoy reopening things, but you still have to be diligent because it's going to come back. So in New Zealand, I um, had some connection to some people that lived there. And I was told that um, almost every single third year medical student in uh, medical school has the uh, obligation to spend a year abroad before they come mm. back to finish their medical education. So that's still in place. And that's obviously going to be a big source of infection if they're not careful. Dixon, can you take the next one, please? I can. Uh, Nicole writes, no, uh, Sam, dear, Sam, hello, Sam, Twiv. Sam, no, th this, is, this is the second Sam. Second the Sam. second Sam. I'm sorry. <laughs> Second All right. <laughs> Sam writes, hi, TWIV team. I had Guillain-Barre syndrome when I was 11 years old, and now I'm 38. The last time I had a flu vaccine was in 2009 during the H1N1. The subsequent year, they warned anyone who had Guillain-Barre syndrome not to take the vaccine. Has this changed? Because I hadn't had a flu vaccine since. Thanks, a fan. Anybody want to jump in on that one? Well, the CDC has a page on Guillain-Barre, and uh, yeah. they said that, you know, the 1976 swine flu vaccine, the risk was about one in 100,000 exactly. people who That's got Guillain-Barre. Um, right. And since then, they monitor the vaccine and its association with Guillain-Barre, and they say there has uh, always been one to two Guillain-Barre cases per million flu vaccine doses administered. So it's like a lower level, but there. But they say it's more likely um, <clears throat> that a person will get Guillain-Barre after influenza than after influenza <laughs> vaccine. <laughs> so right. yeah. They say, it, and the, the illness can be severe. So they say it's, you should still get vaccinated. So there's no- However, on the, on the- um official handout when you get your flu shot if you look at the the vaccine information statement they do say if you have ever had Guillain-Barre syndrome tell your immunizer yeah, and they'll, they'll decide whether so it is it, it's basically yeah we're aware of this and you should be aware of it and you should let your doctor know but you probably <laughs> ought to get a flu shot anyway I think so Dixon, do you want to take the next one since you were starting to read? Well, I would love to. Go sure. Ahead. Nicole writes, hello, TWIV crew. Our housekeeper hasn't been over since early in the pandemic. 
She contracted COVID about two weeks ago, and she is thankfully feeling better. She plans to return to work next week. Do you think it's safe to assume that she has immunity for the next two to three months and have her over while we are all at home working and schooling? Thanks for your insight, Nicole in Arkansas. That's an interesting question. She may have immunity, but do you? Yeah, well, that's the point. That is the point. And how did she catch it? And will she? Well, no, I don't. The problem is immunity to what? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. What okay. kind of immunity? So she may have immunity to disease, but she may still be able to be infected and transmit it to you. Yeah, so yeah, super, I yeah, would yeah. still, if you want to have her come over, I would make sure you all mask and keep distant and so forth. Right. Would you have her tested for the virus, Vincent? You know, this is what Daniel says. If you need to be in, in a situation that's a little risky, you should have everyone involved tested. Yeah. If you have that option, I, I think in this case, I mean, it seems to me like you could just not be in the room when she's cleaning. Yeah, but I just I think the key here is that don't assume that she's not going to be infected. That's yeah, no, that's right. yeah. Just because somebody has had the virus doesn't mean they can't be a carrier. I mean, last earlier, I, I asked Daniel an email question from someone who wanted to go, so that their father's wife had died they wanted to go visit them and you know 12 hours away the father was 92 you know is that a good idea and dan was like you know it's a, it's a wake you're going to be emotional there's no way you can't hug each other and so you just should test everyone beforehand if you can because there there's some things in life you have to do right and at a funeral especially of your 92 year old father who's lost his wife you don't want to sit six feet away with a mask on right <laughs> yeah Hi, Dad. Sorry about Mom. Yeah, yeah. it's very sad, right? Very no. sad. Um, Rich, you're next. Ken writes, there seems to be some debate about whether flu vaccine increases one's chances of non-influenza respiratory infections. This paper says yes, gives a link. And this one only in children gives another link. While other papers seem to indicate there is no inf- uh, no connection and gives references to four different papers, this debate seems to be discouraging some people from getting the flu vaccine. I'll get mine, but wonder how, in principle, a vaccine could make one more susceptible to other viruses. Okay, so I looked at uh, a lot of this. I looked at uh, both of the uh, links to the ones that say yes. And I looked at actually all, but some in more detail of the other uh, references that he gives. And what I came away with, uh, with uh, my own opinion, uh, is that I think that the best studies are these uh, large scale observational studies that are the test negative studies that show no association uh, between a flu vaccine and uh, an increase in susceptibility to other diseases. The others are smaller experimental studies that I don't think are appropriately statistically powered uh, to uh, draw that um, uh, conclusion. And uh, I think I was going to say something else, but I forget what it was. So I will turn it over to you guys. What do you think? That is that is what I've gotten from the <clears throat> flu immunization um, community that I'm that I'm in touch with, that these papers, when they came out, they caused quite a stir. And there was a lot of, oh my gosh, flu vaccines making people sicker. But then you look at the data and you say, really? You, you basing this on a hundred people you looked at? And, yeah, and it's a very small effect also. Yeah. Very, very small effect. And then they're drawing these, these radical conclusions. Um, and then subsequently, much, much larger statistically powered studies have looked at this population wide and found that there's just nothing there. Um, so unfortunately, once something like this gets into the literature, because there is a, a, a rabid anti-vaccination movement, they latch onto this and this never dies. I know what else I was going to say. The, he questions uh, how, in principle, the mm-hmm. vaccine could make one more right. susceptible to other viruses. I would say two things. First of all, uh, in the papers where they uh, discuss this, they don't come to a conclusion. They don't know. And I would say it's irrelevant <laughs> <'Cause> it <doesn't. laughs> because yeah. it's not true. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to think of what, what would be a mechanism of that. I couldn't. I mean, you can talk about stuff like, uh, well, I don't know. 
innate immunity, but it's backwards. Yeah, the, fir- I- the very first thing I would go to is the that maybe in those small studies, the people who got the shot were somehow more more likely or more exposed and that was the answer. They, but, they thought they were protected because they got the shot. Yeah. So yeah. They took and, more risks. Well, in fact, the first paper that he cites, the author saying the discussion, this could be an artifact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they say yeah, even, even the authors don't believe they're on Yeah. 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 There, there sometimes are some debates about whether, uh, Viral infection and a good immune response to a virus can make you slightly more susceptible to bacterial infection um, because of different immune responses sort of counter-regulating one another. But even that's not particularly well understood or certain. And certainly nothing about virus than virus. Right. Ben writes, just want to reiterate one factor often lost in many discussions around reaching herd immunity from COVID-19 through natural infection. A few million people more dying would be an unthinkable tragedy, yes. Also consider the likely greater number of people who'd suffer from longer-term effects of infection, such as documented cardiovascular damage, the long-haul post-viral syndrome, or effects we can't yet anticipate. These effects would have a material effect on those millions' quality of life for years or decades to come. Thanks for everything you and the crew do. Keep on twivering, Ben, from the San Francisco Bay Area, where it's a scorching 102 F beneath smoke-filled skies. Wow, it's hot. And also, the psychological effects of losing your job, of uh, you know not seeing yeah. people you know, doing the things that you're used to, all of these. Yes. Yeah, Ben, this is a, a really great point. Alan Dove. Uh, Kettle writes, Aloha, listener from Oslo in Norway here. I didn't know they said, uh, now I know a little bit of Norwegian, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Um, After listening to TWIV 658, I went to your homepage for that episode and quote from the introduction, Daniel Griffin provides a clinical report on COVID-19 and reinfection with a distinct SARS-CoV-2 isolate. The Director General of the World Health Organization, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, on 11th February, said the following, refers to the transcript um, where um, Tedros spells out COVID-19 with capital C, small O, capital V, small I, capital D, dash 19. Uh, So in the same way that the new virus is called SARS, capital C, small O, capital V, dash 2, with a lower case O in the coronavirus middle part, I think the new disease should be written C-O-V-I-D-19 without the, you know, uh, so it becomes COVID-19 with the mixed case. Uh, it would then also be in line with the two usages in that quoted paragraph ag- above. Keep up the good work. Oh, boy. Well, Kettle, you may have had a valid point back in February, but the world has decided that it is spelled in all caps, C-O-V-I-D, and I'm afraid that's not going to change. The bigger objection to, from my perspective is that because the people naming the disease didn't talk to the people naming the virus, we ended up with two damn different names for this thing, and that has caused ongoing confusion with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Yes. If I may be slightly pedantic about what Kettle writes, um, (laughs) Kettle says that VI in COVID was for virus and D was for disease. And for some reason, I actually had always been under the impression that um, ID was for infectious disease. Hmm. Uh, so that would uh, be capitalized differently. Yeah, than what that's Kettle that's says. mine as well. Well, except that he's got this quote here yeah. from the WHO director. Right now, maybe the WHO director got it wrong. I don't know. So, so where is Kathy quote. now that we need her? Oh, so the director of <laughs> WHO says VI stands for virus. Yeah. Virus, yes, right. Yeah, and I I do want to point out that Kettle is right with us. In yeah. pedantry, yes, okay. absolutely. You can hang this with us, is, Kettle. But whether whether we uh, agree with your pedantry or not uh, is is irrelevant. <laughs> this, is, okay? this is totally an appropriate topic. It's yes, perfect. we're we're into this. And guilty as charged. I agree with and, that, and I, you know. I find it very annoying that both of these things are hyphenated, and SARS-CoV-2 has mixed case. Because whenever you're typing it, you're all over, yeah. and if you're typing it on a on a touch screen, it's even more annoying. Oh yeah. We really should have come up with better names for these. Uh, by the way, <laughs> on the subject of pedantry, Alan, at the top of the show, you were talking about 
nine companies and you refer to something between them. Okay. Isn't that among? It would be among them. Yes. Oof. Between is two yes. and among is more, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. I wanted to make sure of that. <laughs> I agree with Alan though, that the world is conflating COVID and SARS-CoV-2, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not that hard because um, people have AIDS and right. HIV, right? Well, you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're absolutely right. So I don't see why this is such a problem. And they scientists could have called it right, but they could have called it COVID-19 virus. Instead, it's SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. You could call it SARS-CoV-2 disease. Instead, we've got COVID-19 disease. It's just I mean, and, SARS. And yeah, I, agree. I think HIV AIDS was yeah, the name. First, we had too. SARS. Been, that's right. Well, you don't want to have the disease and the virus different names. I think it's much more convenient if you have the disease and the virus. <laughs> well, the problem is SARS-CoV-2 has the disease embedded in it, right? But this is not yes. really SARS. It's not the same as SARS-1. Right. I like SARS-1 because SARS-Coronavirus, the v coronavirus that causes this disease, SARS, and I think that worked really well. And then people just called it the SARS virus, right? So right. I, I don't know what... I I like the fact that we can actually very clearly make a distinction between the virus and the disease yeah, because yeah. so many people don't think about a distinction between infection okay. and disease. Yes. Yeah, so um, and again, a, that's a place where I harp on things with my students. So then yeah. COVID-19 is not transmitted, right? The virus yeah. SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted. And even physicians and scientists get it wrong. And as you will see, we have a letter. I don't know if we'll get to it today, but the guy wrote to Journal of American Medical Association has said COVID-19 is not transmitted and they wouldn't yes. accept his comment. Right. Uh, right. uh, right. Whenever we get to that letter, it's a great letter. Yeah. Yeah. That is a great letter. Uh, by the way, the, the webinar that I was on was um, billed as being about COVID-19 vaccines. Although in that case, in that <laughs> case, works. I, I made an okay. allowance because they are looking at disease, disease outcome disease. rather yeah. than infection. And initially I said, oh, God, there's SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, damn it. And then I was listening to the call. I was like, oh, OK, I stand corrected. These are COVID-19 vaccines. Yeah, I think that's OK. Yeah. yeah. Be, I'm that as well. OK, uh, Brianne, you're next. Greg writes, the issue of screening test sensitivity summarized in a couplet. High sensitivity makes PCR tests seem the hero, but the accurate accuracy of a test which you can't get is zero. A couplet. That's, that's our zero. first couplet, I think. Yeah, yes. right. That's right. That's nice. Excellent. And add that to Twivverse. You know what Twivverse is, right? The Dixon's new family in the order Twivverse. <laughs> <laughs> Dixon, do you know what the Twivverse is? Um, I think I do. I, I'll, I'll off off the record. We'll talk. <laughs> okay, so this but we have a following. We do have a following. Okay, yes. this one we should say for Daniel. Yeah, I see. This is uh, my question is yeah. more for Dr. Griffin. Okay, so Dixon, skip down to John. Please. John, yeah, John writes. Hi, Twiv. It's currently sunny and eighty-eight degrees Fahrenheit here in Nashville, Tennessee. I work as a physician assistant at a neurology clinic with subspecialty expertise in demyelinating disorders. And I wanted to make a few comments about the discussion around transverse myelitis in episode 661. Transverse myelitis is a term that fails to capture the full clinical picture of pathologies that present in the spinal cord in an acute slash subacute clinical setting. A better term is transverse myelopathy, given that the differential diagnosis is quite broad, including but not limited to demyelinating diseases such as idiopathic transverse myelitis, multiple sclerosis, and neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. Infectious etiologies, vascular pathologies, for example, spinal cord dis infarction, mechanical spinal stenosis, ouch. Most commonly, however, transverse myelopathy is driven by inflammatory condition and may be the first symptom of what eventually become multiple sclerosis in many patients. The incidence of transverse myelopathies goes up significantly when you account for conditions such as multiple sclerosis and my neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders. While it's true that we don't know the full case history of the patient, the patient is an N of one, it's entirely possible that this patient is a young female under the age of 50 years old, where transverse myelopathies secondary to an inflammatory, i.e. like autoimmune pathologies such as the beginning of what may eventually turn out to be MS. 
the age, gender, family history, and comorbidities will be quite important in this clinical scenario. And to the points already made in the podcast, I have rarely seen a temporal association of inflammatory transverse myelopathies with a temporal association with a recent vaccination. Thanks for all you do and keep up the great work. The best, John from Nashville, Tennessee. It's great. great. Very informative. Very Thank interesting. you. Yeah. Very informative. And I, I, I have to say, one of my absolute favorite medical terms is idiopathic. Oh, absolutely. Yes. That's right. I, I, I of, go to uh, an idiopath re- routinely. One of Daniel's. <laughs> <for> my diagnosis. <laughs> one of Daniel's favorite terms is in my experience. <laughs> that's right that's exactly. so watch out when the doctor says in my experience right. um, <laughs> let's tell you that I have a, I had a dear friend who had um, spinal stenosis and there's nothing more disappointing than watching a dear friend slowly deteriorate to the point he was my fishing partner and he needed a folding chair just to go to the river and just to sit there and watch it he couldn't even fish after a while but he, he could at least sit and watch which is very sad very sad did you hear that Apparently, there was a, another neurological event in July with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was not publicized. No. no. I heard a little bit of a rumor. Yeah, I did, I did as well. Um, I, I couldn't find anything because it wasn't publicized, but this may not be the first. I don't know. Yeah. Th- what I had heard was that um, one of the people in the trial has since progressed to multiple sclerosis. Hmm. And it was perhaps sort of one of their first MS symptoms. So whether it was related to MS that was already happening mm-hmm. or whether it was okay. a, a right. similar transverse myelitis was unclear. Boy, that gets complicated. Yeah. Well, and Daniel said earlier that he worries about the adenovirus vectors because adenoviruses do things like this. Right. Uh, Rich, you're next. Uh, Agda writes. I try to keep my grumpy side at bay, but after listening to the last TWIV, I thought I would write with a different perspective since so many people were commenting on how to get Christian Drosten to appear on TWIV more or some of his content translated for TWIV listeners. I would say don't bother as you guys are doing an excellent job, and I don't think there are many huge insights lurking in his German content. Starting in March, I've listened to every DOS coronavirus podcast and then switched to scanning of transcripts when they became available. And I have a theory why people are so fascinated. First, his speech cadence in German is really nice to listen to, relaxed and self-assured at once. The format is very didactic. Science communication is badly needed here, and the podcasts help fill the gap. Second, Due to his standing as a researcher and maybe his personality, Drosten sounds very, very sure of what he's talking about. I would love to know more about how he got to the figures that SARS-CoV-2 transmission is 10% fomites, 40% aerosol, 50% droplets, or why 1% to 5% of people could be reinfected, since critics would often latch on to some of those statements. I guess many listeners loved to hear him linking different pieces of evidence slash research and then coming up with a possible mechanism. Who doesn't like mechanisms? I'm not sure all of those exercises stood the proof of time. Anyway, the research he refers to is the same that is being discussed on TWIV, often by the authors themselves. One of Drosten's more interesting mechanism hunting episodes was episode 47 commenting on work from ralph barrick's lab among others i've been waiting for barrick to come back to twiv for quite a while now thanks agda well wait no longer that's right (laughs) even even by now you've already heard him yep very interesting yeah i someone someone else wrote that he gets 60 million downloads per episode and I, I, I wrote back and said, I'm so jealous. And they said, don't be jealous. I said, there's all kinds of crap going on. I mean, he gets death threats. He gets this and that. Don't worry about it. You're doing fine. <laughs> uh, I'm having a good time. He's, he has um, a good yeah. personality. For, he has a good personality for sure. Yeah. It's always yeah. fun. Yeah. 
Um, but well, yeah. thank you, Agda. As someone who does not speak or read German, um, it's good to know that I guess we're not missing much. Well, there's there's something there. You know, you can go to the transcripts, just open them in Chrome. They'll get translated into English, and you can kind of get an idea of what's going on. So the latest uh, episode. So we're putting summaries on Twim, Twiv. Uh, one of our listeners uh, is doing that, and we have a summary of the September 1 DAS coronavirus. And the first thing he said, the first summary she makes is he says, Yeah, there are lots of variants. They have minor effects in cell culture. Whether they do anything in people is unknown. And I love that, <laughs> right? <laughs> D614G, I'm talking at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He says, yeah, we, we don't know if they mean anything. So uh, listen, there's some good stuff. A, yeah, he's a he's a good scientist and uh, does a good job communicating a science. And, uh, you know, we can never have too little of that. But I you must know, too much, say too, too much of that. I must say, I think in Germany, they value um, knowledge more than yeah. we do in the U.S. Now, all the listeners of TWIV, I, I know you value knowledge, but there are not 60 million listeners Right. Per Twiv, and there never will be because knowledge is not valued as much here. Um, How long are uh, Christian's podcasts? I think, uh, I think they can be two hours long. Mm. The, the transcripts are apparently very long. Germans will tolerate long entertainment. <laughs> yeah, the, the ring. A couple of beers. If, right? if I can, if I can just stereotype a little bit. There. <laughs> I once went to an opera in Vienna that was like. Six hours. Yeah, this is the country that produced Wagner. Just bear that in mind. <laughs> it was. It was a ring. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe we need to, yeah, maybe we should have been born in Germany and done twin yeah. in Germany. We would have more listeners. But we're happy the the way we are. Yeah. Anyway. It's fine. And we love our listeners. Um, by the way, you know, um, I have one last anecdote here. So I think about two years ago, I appealed to people to subscribe to our YouTube channel, right? So this was when we we used to travel. I'd put videos of TWIV episodes on YouTube. And we had like 18,000 subscribers, which is pretty good, mainly driven by the lectures I put up. And, and uh, Google had a program where you could get some kind of a grant if you had more than 25,000 subscribers. So I put out an appeal and <laughs> we ended up getting a thousand more. So, so you know, it wasn't working. However, SARS-CoV-2 has now pushed that to nearly 65,000 subscribers, which is great. So, and I want to ask, uh, go and subscribe. I'd love to break 100,000 because that's kind of a magic number. And, you know, the thing on YouTube is the more you have, the more you get. Because the more subscribers, the more sure. they're likely to recommend your video when, they, when someone looks at someone else. And, and I must admit... When you hit a hundred thousand, they give you, they send you a platinum disc, and I really want that. <laughs> Can you imagine a platinum disc with this, whatever? The, yeah, that would be cool. Now that's not okay. Good. YouTubers, smash that like button. Be sure you subscribe. <laughs> oh yeah, whenever guess, that's uh, what they do. You get Make more sure light subscribe. room on the internet. You get yes, you get more, right. you get priority boarding. And, Remember and the by old the way, contents. I listen to a, I watch a YouTuber who uh, says at the end. And if you don't like my content, try listening at 75% speed. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny, isn't it? All right, that's yeah. TWIV663. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIV. All the show notes, the letters, and so forth are there. Links to things we talk about. If you have a question or a comment, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. There you'll find links to... Uh, Cafe Press, Patreon, PayPal, et cetera. We'd love your support. Uh, and um, I think that's about it. Yeah. Dixon des Palmier is at trickinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. Good to be back. Brianne Barker's at Drew University over on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. That's in North Central Florida, by the way. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Fair enough. Always a good time. The sun's coming out, Dixon. Did you notice the clouds broke up and uh, there's blue sky showing? Actually clearing. Alan, you can't look out the window and see what no, I'm looking I, at. I, I can see it's, it's clear blue sky. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, but it Not wasn't. here. 
It's not in Drew. It's, it's not coming. in Madison. It's coming. Now. Wait for it. Yeah, it's nice. It's very nice. <laughs> Alan Dove's at turbidplaque.com on Twitter. Alan Dove. Thanks, Alan. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Rackett. Good job on the vaccine work. Yeah, it was great. I, I totally. That was super cool. That Maybe. was great. Maybe we can Absolutely. pick a title that somehow encompasses all the vaccine information. Huh. Or, or not. I don't know. Uh, Cleopatra's needle? <laughs> why would that be? Uh, Appropriate. It's a needle. It's a needle. It's 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 it's, it's a play on words. And why That's Cleopatra? It. Well, because everybody's familiar with that one. They know about Cleopatra's needle. You don't know about Cleopatra's needle. Isn't it? So, isn't obelisk. it a sculpture or something in the middle? Yeah. No, it's an obelisk. It's an a obelisk. obelisk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>